Inception Radio, that's right, not only in our top secret bunker, it is now a top secret armored bunker, yes, we have some new arms in the bunker, <laughs> welcome to tonight's show, we have, uh, geez, tonight's going to be the biggest show that uh, we've ever done as far as fitting three concurrent guests in one show, uh, we got a lot to talk about. I got a lot to update you guys on to get you ready for our first guest who is going to be uh, coming on shortly in about 15 minutes. That'll be Command Sergeant Major James Norton. All right, all this took place. What well, we're going to be talking about in our first hour, hour and 15 minutes tonight, is known as. Uh, the incident at Fort Benning, Georgia. It took place in 1977, around September 1977. Some date it to September 14th. And uh, it's been making major news recently because uh, Command Sergeant Major James Norton has come forward. He is still active duty. He is still based out of Fort Benning, but at Fort uh, McClellan right now. In September 1977, during a joint attack weapon system test, known as JAWS for short, at Fort Benning, uh, the entire base witnessed what some people call a UFO invasion. As many as 1,300 troops were involved in the event, most were left with severe psychological trauma and missing time. Uh, Command Sergeant Major James Norton, who was now stationed at Fort McClellan, Alabama, back then he was a Buck Sergeant E-5 at the time, he witnessed an eerie encounter with UFOs and the military on September 14, 1977. He was sent to the range a little before midnight along with anywhere between 1,200 to 1,300 other troops to perform a live fire uh, exercise with their new weapon system called JAWS, the Joint Attack Weapon System. Uh, even the Secretary of the Army at the time was on the range. Um, he remembers that when they started the live fire, all of a sudden there were orbs in the night sky. Uh, that looked like stars. He says the next thing he saw was lasers crisscrossing the night sky and the command of cease fire was heard because there was something downrange. It looked like military helicopters, big lights. Um, at the same time, military helicopters did appear out of nowhere and explosions were heard. Um, military helicopter was downed there were orbs in the night skies that were changing variety of colors uh, and then a triangle shaped UFO showed up and the soldiers around Norton were in shock after the incident many soldiers became ill every soldier was briefed and that, that if they were to disclose any information from that night that they would be court martialed and sent to Leavenworth um when Norton obtained his medical rep records, it disclosed that his illness 
that he described to me of uh, being like measles was of unknown origin. Back when this happened, uh, his temperature was 104. He was placed in a steel tub for two days in ice water to bring his temperature down. Um, he had a memory lapse, or as we know it in UFO lore, it's called missing time. He could not remember how he was on the range and later found himself in the woods with a broken leg. There's a lot of time distortion. During a hypnosis session, he learned he was abducted and taken aboard this craft, and medical experiments were conducted. Um, also, a couple days after this, um, two jets came in that were whitewashed. Pretty much they are jets that come in that have no tail numbers, no, no anything no transponders they came in they pick up records and they left here's where it gets interesting <clears throat> Norton picked up a metallic piece from the crash site that has strange hieroglyphics on it this uh, metal piece cannot be burned a hacksaw will not cut it uh, if you bent it it'll go back to its original shape Norton has the piece of metal somewhere um, this kind of is reminiscent of the Roswell material. Um, Norton is willing and ready to show the evidence to credible ufologists and the media. Norton claims to have proof that UFOs are real, and uh, he has the silent p or the, the piece to prove that. So, what I did is uh, Friday night I had Paul Dale Roberts on, and if you remember, he he was talking about this story. Well, I should have jumped on it right there, but I didn't. And uh, uh, I guess uh, James was on a Kevin Smith show and told a bit of his story. So yesterday, um, I called Paul and I said, Hey, Paul, um, I see this story's blowing up everywhere. Can you give me... Um, Mr. Norton's email or so I can contact him and he gave me his direct phone number and said you know call him in a bit he'll be expecting it so I called him and we we talked for I don't know maybe 15 minutes he shared his story with me I told him I'd like to have him on the show he didn't confirm he just said that uh, he wants to get his story out there so he was supposed to call me back last night never did um, so this morning I was doing some more research and I found out uh, the story of John Vasquez who came forward I'm not sure when he came forward with the story but he released a book in 2000 titled The Incident at Fort Benning and it's pretty much a carbon copy if you were to, to compare the two stories it seems like John Vasquez um, was actually abducted uh, uh, earlier than Command Sergeant Major James Norton because the last thing John remembers seeing as you'll hear tonight is uh, these big giant orbs and he was going up what felt like an escalator um, but James Norton remembers a big giant triangle showing up so he must have uh, uh, had consciousness longer than John. Anyway, the two stories are one and the same. Uh, it's just two different people. There was many companies out there on the field that night. And uh, two different people. They weren't together. They were separated. Uh, John was looking for people to come forward. Um, out of the 1,300, you would think that uh, we this case would be the biggest in history. But the way that John describes it is like these people were almost brainwashed that night. And uh, now that James has come forward, this is really blowing up all over forums, all over the internet. So tonight what we're going to do is uh, <clears throat> talk with James here in about five minutes, ten minutes, and uh, get his story. And then we're going to hear from John Velasquez and uh, get his take on it 
And uh, then we're going to bring on comedian Jim Tierney, who has been on the show before. Actually, I believe he was on uh, The Jackal's Head when I co-hosted uh, about a year ago. But he's going to be on tonight in our last segment after we get done with this story. I also have with me tonight my co-host, David Riles, who I had to brief on this story um, ten minutes right before here, the everyone. show. <laughs> So it's going to be interesting, and, uh, you know, you guys in the chat, feel free. Most of you, some of you, are, are more uh, in-depth in the story than myself, have done more research or more up-to-date with it. I am just somebody who was able to get the right connections and uh, put this together, and hopefully it unfolds uh, right uh, I tried to find the Kevin Smith episode. Um, I guess you got to um, pay to listen to that. I guess you have to. He has like a member section. So I didn't listen to the interview, but ever since that interview, there's a lot of questions floating around, and I hope we get to answer some of them tonight. With uh, with James on. So today I called uh, I called James and talked with him, and uh, I said, "Look, we're doing the show tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. I'll call you on about 9:20." And he says, "Well, I'll be at work at 8 o'clock, which is Central Time, so 9 o'clock." So um, he's just on post. So he says, as long as we can just uh, do it over the phone, it, it'll be fine. So he's expecting our call in eight minutes. And uh, we probably won't keep him too long, maybe a half an hour at the most, because I have a 45-minute interview to play with John Velasquez. And then we're bringing on Jim Tierney for the last half hour or so. And uh, I'm going to try to get this all done. There's multiple stories out there um, about the helicopters that night. Um, the military helicopters that were shot down during this incident were never reported to the FAA. And also, uh, uh, James Norton was burned from a mysterious substance from this incident. Uh, he is now stationed... Well, see, they keep saying he's stationed at Fort McClellan, but he's telling me he's out of... Um, He's back at Fort Benning, but he's currently at Fort McClellan. So he describes how they experimented with biological and chemical substances on the base, and that something else is going on. That there is UFO activity at the base, and that the military seems to be test flying UFOs. This is the first active military person I've heard uh, step forward like this. When I contacted Jerry Pippen this morning, he was under the um, thoughts that um, James was in jail for uh, coming forward with this, but he he was just detained. The other day he was filming on the base, and um, they came up and got him and took him to headquarters, and he says, what's going on? This is an open post. Other people film here. Why can't I? And um, he basically says he was threatened to um, to shut up, that he'll be hurt, his family will be hurt, and his attitude is bring it on. And I, I do not want to facilitate somebody getting hurt, but I, I have to assure you that he is all forward with this. He has already brought this information forward on the Kevin Smith show. And we are bringing it forward for you here. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, he's, he's a Vietnam veteran. He's been in the Army a very, very long time. Um, some people out there do not believe his story. Some think that he seen the John Velasquez video and, and, and did the story and kind of made things up to make it look like he was there, but his information that he has seems just to line up 
he's got more info than John even has that John confirmed that he's never even put out there so it's uh, interesting uh, Norton has uh, incredible night vision footage of UFOs of all colors uh, that he's recorded on the base I don't know where them are I haven't asked him that um one of it is a, of a UFO going from horizon to horizon. The other is a mere two seconds. It just shoots all the way across the sky. He has video footage of a triangular-shaped object that hovers over the base. No sound being emitted. And he has uh, all of his video footage uh, for any credible ufologist to review. So... It's going to be interesting, and the story I'm reading, all this information I'm giving you now, is currently up at ufoblogger.com. I'll drop the link in the chat room so you guys can kind of go over it. Um, there's, there's stories up everywhere. They're up at Project Avalon, uh, Gateway Forum, Unexplained-Mysteries. I mean, you can just search... Um, James Norton's name and you're going to find a ton of articles with this stuff just blowing up like crazy so it's going to be interesting what have you been up to Dave let's uh, let's just do a quick uh, update and we'll take our first break uh, not too much um, I went seeing a ball game yesterday and uh, it's probably where I disappeared to um and then my wife's car broke down, and uh, my neighbor across the street, good guy, um, also that sees uh, UFOs on a daily basis, kind of like what I do or what I see. And uh, he came over and helped fix the car for me today. Did you get it all fixed up? Yep, it's fixed up. What it's, was it? it um, was it the, that, that spot that was leaking, that gasket? Yeah, the thermostat housing blew apart on a little four, or Chevy Avia 05. Okay, that's what your. It's just is? a little plastic piece. I but didn't. I thought your car was like a little Mitsubishi or something. No, nah, I used to have one of those. Is it, have you always had the same car? The little red cars, a uh, uh, Chevy. No, nah, before no, I usually had a piece of junk car. <laughs> no, when usually I met you, I, you I had a, drove you junkers. Had a, when I met you, you had a red five-speed. Yeah, that was the little Chevy Avio. Really? Yeah. Neat little car, good yeah. gas mileage. Yeah, I had one of the best cars out there. I uh, it was a '93 uh, RX-7. Amazing! I totaled it in Atlanta, Georgia. Still up there, actually. Now somebody rebuilt it after I flew over an embankment and landed in a bank parking lot. <laughs> nice. <All right. laughs> so we're gonna take our break. When we come back, uh, we will have, we hope to have um, Command Sergeant James Norton on the line with us uh, he goes by Jim Oh, and I'd just like to say I, I haven't really got to go out uh, sky watching lately, so I've been uh, just kind of busy with my leg yeah. hurting, and, or my legs hurting both legs <laughs> Well, I know, so, I, I know the network's kind of grown a lot since uh, you know, the past eight months, and, and Basically, the past eight months is our Skywatch season. Um, it, it's different. You know, like people that live up in Michigan, you know, they stay indoors all winter. Well, we stay indoors all summer because it's so damn hot and the Excuse bugs us. will carry you away. I mean, you can you can put on all the clothes and spray you want. You'll just, they bite you through your clothes. And uh, it's it's just insane to go out there. I mean, you can. You can. But uh, you'll pay the price. So we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna try to keep continue sky watching. We just gotta get some new implements to keep the bugs away and uh, keep it up. So we'll be back here shortly in a few minutes, and hopefully we'll have on with us Command uh, Sergeant Major James Norton. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back while we're talking to him. Feel free to pop your questions in the chat. If you uh, are up to date on this uh, case, pop your questions in there, and I will be watching it. We'll be right back. (laughs) 
insight. Get a lay of the land. Want to know what's really going on? <laughs> do what I do. Listen to Future Theater. It airs every Saturday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, on the Inception Radio Network. com. We'll see you there. Hi, Bob Tarmac for MJ'sHealthyWay.com. Are you into vitamins, nutrition, meal replacements, health shakes, uh, keeping your body in good shape, your internal engine going? <laughs> Boy, do I have a perfect place for you. MJ'sHealthyWay.com. They offer the best service and products, and they'll tell you anything you need to know about any product they have to offer. I get all my vitamins, meal replacements, shakes from MJ'sHealthyWay.com. That's spelled M-J-S, HealthyWay.com. There's so much more at the website. Go check it out, mjshealthyway.com. This is Myron Rogers, host of West Georgia Paranormal Radio, and I listen to the paranormal guys, MJ and Adam the Skeptic. On the Inception Radio Network, every Sunday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Remember, hang your head. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. Welcome back to Inception Radio, here with uh, myself, Jamie Havikin, co-host David Riles, and Command Sergeant Major James Norton. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Um, i got to say, uh, I appreciate you taking your time out to come on and talk with us tonight. Um, this this story is just going insane. I talked to John Velasquez today, and, and you know he broke his case 11 years ago. And he had, he's like, he doesn't understand why it's blowing up so big. And I said, well, the Internet has grown a lot, and there's so many people out there that are running with this story. Right. So uh, I broke down your case to everybody. This is just a fascinating case that that happened back in 1977. Um, yes, sir. Can you give us a quick rundown on exactly uh, your version of that night? Uh, yes, sir. It was uh, September 14th, 1977, and uh, we were going to a special range that they had just built for uh, training for military personnel. It was called a Joint Attack Weapon System, JAWS for short. And uh, they were 12 to 1,300 troops on the line that night. So we, all, we were all taking times, you know, on the fire line up there. And uh, we got started uh, around midnight, a little after midnight. And then uh, we started doing our live fire, you know, and we were switching up positions, doing the different uh, weapons and stuff. And I guess it was in uh, 30, 45 minutes into the, uh, the uh, you know, weapon system, and then uh, we started seeing objects in the sky. 
and uh, I'm thinking, okay. And then uh, they were coming like from across the sky. And uh, at first they looked like just orbs because they were kind of small when we first seen them. And then uh, as they got closer, they got bigger. And then uh, next thing I know, we're hearing ceasefire, ceasefire on the range. But there's so much going on, so much, you know, from all the weapons being fired, nobody could hear the command to cease fire. Yeah. And uh, uh, I know at the uh, at the building there, they've got a, a two story building where they do the PA system and all for you know cease fire and stuff like that. The uh, personnel that's in charge of the range, and they're screaming over the PA, you know, cease fire, cease fire, but we can't hear them. I mean, because all the weapons going on, we're talking about 50 cal, 60 cal, you know, M60, all kind of different weapons going off. And uh, so we see this object come down low, and then it takes off and shoots across the sky. Then we see three UH uh, UH-58 gunships come in, chasing this object. And, uh, it, it, you know, it just zips out, gone out of sight just that quick. Uh, a few minutes later... We seen them coming back around, and that's when all heck broke loose. Uh, we actually right. got fired on from these crafts. Uh, the crafts shot at the helicopters. I mean, all hell broke loose that night. All hell broke loose. Now, do these and, things look like uh, star-like objects? Were they just bright lights? Uh, no, these were circular objects, uh, like a disc. Oh, really? They were like a disc, and they, they really glowed real bright when they got close to us. Real, real bright. And what were they firing? Like a laser, or were, was it just uh, chaos? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, different color lasers. Yes, sir. We had like uh, red, uh, green, blue, all different color type lasers. Now, I got somebody in chat, uh, you know, they, they want to know, you know, what's your current rank, and they're saying Fort McClellan is closed. It's not closed, is it? No, Fort McClellan is not closed. Uh, I am uh, with a security detail out here at Fort McClellan. And my rank is Command Sergeant Major. I am reserved now. I am no longer active duty. Okay. I am reserved. And uh, we have a perimeter here that we secure every night out here. So when did this get weird? I mean, I understand when when you start seeing beams, uh, that gets a little crazy. John's story, right. he says that... Um, some of the people were just standing there, you know, in, in line, uh, almost with right. like a blank stare on their face, while a few others were active trying to, you know, uh, get right. cover. That, that's what I couldn't understand. We had some walking around uh, in a daze. They laid their weapons down on the ground. I mean, they were just walking around like they were in a daze, you know, like they didn't know where they were at, what they were doing. I mean, it, yeah, it, it was weird. It was weird because, you know, I tried hollering at a, at a few of them to, you know, find out what was wrong with them. They never spoke back to me, never uh, even looked at me. They just kept walking on by. And I'm thinking, you know, what's up? What's what's happening, you know? Yeah. Well, this and, is yeah, it, this is where it, it, John's uh, story ends because the last thing he remembers seeing is, is the, you know, one of these bright things, uh, a big one right. about the size of a Volkswagen. And when I yeah. told them that yours goes on a little bit farther to where you see a big triangle UFO show up, tell us about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure did. Uh, it looked like it was maybe a football field long, a half football field wide. It had lights on the bottom of it. It made no sound whatsoever. It was just hovering with no sound whatsoever. And I said, you know, it's not a blimp. It's no, no kind of, you know, balloon or anything like that. This was a solid object. It was solid. What what role do you think it was playing? Was it military? Was it whatever was firing on you? I, I I'm not sure. I am not sure if it was something that we had to test us, or if it was something from somewhere else. But it didn't look like anything I've ever seen before. And I've been in the military for a long time. I've been in Air Force bases. You know, I've seen all kind of jets. Uh, you know aircraft and things like that. I have never, ever seen anything like this. Never. Okay. Um, were you ever stationed out, out uh, west, out at Fort Bliss or Fort Hood, or not, not Fort Hood, but, uh, you know, out uh, in uh, right. that area? 
trying to remember what right. Viper told me. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we uh, well, there was actually a base shut down in Utah because of UFOs, and uh, this base was closed for over two months because of an uh, uh, incident happened at that, at that time out there. Okay. And uh, I talked to several people that were there and witnessed it also. And, uh, yeah, the whole base was closed down for two months. Now, that's pretty bad when a military base gets closed down and yeah. evacuated. Yeah. That's pretty bad. Now, the helicopter that was shot down this night, um, uh, what happened? Was it hit with one of these lasers or a ball of light? Yes, sir. It was like a ball of light, similar to a laser, but it was it was bigger than a laser. And, yeah, the, the one went down. The one chopper went down. And, uh, you know, JP-4 is a real uh, potent fuel. Yeah. And, and when it got hit, it exploded. I mean, it, it went into a ball of fire and went down. Uh, the second one was hit, and the tail rotor, and it all also rotated down, which it hit pretty hard, but they survived. Okay. And see, what really got me... What really got me after all this happened that night, the next day, the post commander shut the whole post down. Nobody in, nobody out. Now, you just don't close the post down for, you know, any type of reason. You just don't. Yeah. Now, the base you're talking about in Utah, is that Dugway Proving Grounds? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to verify yes. that. Now, the, the uh, what was it, the Secretary of the Army was there at the time. Yes, sir, well. Clifford Alexander. Yes, sir. Sure was. I was standing just a few feet from him. Was he at a podium? Like, sir? Was he at a podium? Uh, no, he was standing with his aides on the back part of the range. Okay. And uh, he had, I guess, 20, maybe 20 of his aides with him, uh, you know, lower-ranking people in the military, which we had a uh, three-star general there, uh, two-star general. I mean, you name it, all the way down. He had all of his aides there, you know, for support. And it, it was unbelievable. I mean, it, it just, uh, what, what I seen, what happened, and, and all that was involved in it, I don't know if it was things we had or what we didn't have. I, I just don't know why that our government would do something to our troops like that. Yeah. I, I just don't I just don't understand it, why. Because there was a lot of us that got injured. I mean, some of us got burnt real bad. It, it was like a, a red powder um, on our clothes, on our, on our uniforms. You know, back then we wore BDUs in. But, yeah, it was like a red powder mist. And uh, and then uh, and what was bad, the next day, everybody that was on that range that night come down with a case of measles the next day. Huh. Everybody. I'm talking about everybody come down with measles the next day. So I don't know if it's some kind of chemical agent they used on us or some kind of bacteria or, or what it was. And uh, now, when, when, now, is when that still going? To, sir? Sorry to jump Sorry to jump in there. Is that still active? Do you guys still get that now? Oh, yeah. The, yeah, because yeah, Viper, um, uh, you know, the guy that has a similar story, you know, he wasn't uh, at this event, but he, he's familiar with, with this kind of. He says he still gets outbreaks of this. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Well, you know, they try to analyze this. Uh, I was I was uh, held two days in the hospital. My temperature went to 106. Every 15 minutes, they were dumping me in a metal bathtub with ice water. They held me in there for 15 minutes. They take me out for 15 minutes. This went around the clock for two days to try to get my temperature down. Yeah. And uh, the all the blood work they done, samples on our clothes and all. Is uh, the report and the medical records that I have on me also shows of unknown origin. They cannot analyze this. So what what was your last memory before waking up in the woods? Um, you woke up with a broken uh, leg too, didn't you? Right. Yes, sir. Uh, the bright light. I mean, it, it was just so intense, like you were looking at the sun right at your face. That's the last thing I remembered. Now, do you remember any, um, you know, because John kind of thinks it was like a, it could have been like a mass abduction uh, scenario. Do right. you remember any type of medical experiments or anything strange like that? Oh, yes, sir. I was uh, put under hypnosis, and I have the audio of the uh, whole uh, event. 
but the uh, the the doctor that put me under under did not want his name released or anybody to hear his voice because he was a military doctor, so okay. he was worried about his career. So in the audio tapes I have, you don't hear his voice. All you hear is me describing what happened to me, what they done to me, and, and, and you know, and all of that. But I, I remember seeing real, real bright. And I know I was either floating or laying on the table. I remember that. And I, I'm trying to get up. I can't move. I can't speak or anything. And it's like I'm being held down, but there's no straps on me. Nothing. Nothing holding me down. And I'm trying my damnedest to move, and, 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 you know, and get up. And I couldn't do it. It was like I was paralyzed. Yeah. Um. Even the next day, uh, John says that that uh, people were were still almost like they were under the influence of something, like they were yes, just sir. walking around, uh, just yes, sir. you know. Yeah, we 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 actually uh, had people go look for the other troops because they were missing. We couldn't locate them. They were looking all over, and they finally, you know, found them, and they were still in a daze, like they didn't know what happened where they were at. But they didn't even know their name. I mean, I, I don't know what was used on us, but it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. And I hope to God it was not our own government that done this to us. Yeah. I hope it wasn't. Well, you know, there's been tests done on the public in the past that's known about pretty pretty bad stuff, but, you know, yes, on your own troops. Um, so when did you first uh, start releasing some of this information that this happened? Well, uh, I looked for John for a long time, but I met John that night on the range. Yeah. And I met him. I, I, I spoke a few words to him. And uh, I've been looking for John for a long time, and I finally found him on Facebook. I've been searching uh, Google, everything. Every, I have searched and searched. And finally, uh, I got a hold of Bruce. When I seen uh, on, on this uh, page, it said Incident Fort Benning. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, holy crap. So I contacted Bruce and gave him a sworn statement. It, it was a, a notary public. I had to send it mail to him, a statement. So if you read in the book where it says Sergeant N, that is me. Okay. Because at the time I was active duty and I could not use my last name. All right. Now, so I am the Sergeant N in the... In the, in the transcripts. Okay, yeah, and uh, John will talk about that book later, and everybody will have a chance to get it. Um, where did this piece of metal come into play? I know these whitewashed jets come in, and this is strange because I have another friend who worked at uh, Wright Patterson, and he claims around the same time in '77 that right. whitewashed jets came in and were followed by these yes, orange balls of lights. Um, yes, sir. How did the metal yes, come sir. into play that you obtained, and, and what's up with these jets? Uh, my Where my unit was located, we were kind of up on a hill, okay? Uh, Lawson Field was kind of down in a valley right next to the Chattahoochee River, and we could see the whole airport, the airstrip, the runways and everything. And when I was uh, back down on the unit, at the edge of the fence, we were, you know, back there doing some work. And I looked up, and I seen these two jets land. No tail numbers, no FAA numbers, nothing. Just pure whitewash, two of them. And, you know, I'm watching this uh, port lift pick this craft up or whatever. It was covered with a tarp. You couldn't see much of it, but you could see the bottom of it. Yeah. It was real shiny, metallic, you know, looking. And uh, the uh, guy that was in charge of the security at the, at the airfield was in my unit. And later on, he told me what he saw and everything. And uh, so I said, okay. I said, uh, when are they leaving? He said, I don't know. He said, we're on this security detail until they leave out of this base. And I'm thinking, okay. And, I mean, they've got it covered uh, around the flock, standing there armed with weapons around the clock and uh, well I don't know what to tell you this part or not but anyway well, uh, there's the a pieces quick, that a quick that thing come in quick. To, um, go, go ahead sir did the did the, the whitewash jets did they have a uh, 
Let's see. Were the tails of the jets? Did they have a red stripe on them or anything? Or were yes. They, they did have a red stripe on them. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, red stripe. All right. Viper just asked yeah, that. So. I'm only probably a uh, hundred meters away from the the airport. Okay. All and right. Now you can. I'm oh, sorry to interrupt uh, about the. That's okay, sir. That's okay. So you were you were saying about you guys were guarding this uh, this uh, right right sir that uh, at the time I was a military police and uh, and see that's what I couldn't understand why these jets had no FAA numbers on no numbers on the tail section not on the side or anything just pure whitewashed you know and I'm thinking this is strange you know I don't understand this you know why they have no numbers on them ever. Uh, craft that flies, airplane, jet, whatever, has numbers on it. These had no numbers whatsoever. None. And what really got my attention was the two guys that are dressed in all in black. And I don't know if it was an M4 they had or whatever it was. You could tell it was an automatic weapon. And they were two of them standing at the back of the uh, the jet when they were loading this equipment up. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sure were. And I knew they wasn't military. I don't know. They may have been black officers. I don't know what they were. But we were allowed to come so far into that perimeter that we had. We could not go in close enough to where we could actually physically, you know, see it or touch it. Yeah. But we could see what was, it was, a tarp was draped over them, and we could see the bottom portion of it, which was real shiny like aluminum, but it had, had a real gloss to it. So the the piece of metal you have, where did that come from? Uh, off the range. Okay. Yes, sir. Because that's that's, I, uh, that's I, I thought I got caught, but it's the time my rank, I, you know, because uh, when I seen it, I reached down, picked it up, and I looked around to make sure nobody was watching. So I shoved it up under my BDU uniform shirt, and I walked around a little bit more, and I found a couple more pieces. So I done the same with them. So I actually had three pieces. Wow! And and um, I just like to you know a lot of people that are listening in are saying that they know people, you know that you could talk to, but you're already in contact with some high level people in ufology that, that oh, are helping yes, you. Oh so. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, you so. know uh, when I talked with Stan, he 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 contacted me. I've talked with him several times in the last few days. I think he was in uh, Canada when he called me back. Yeah. Uh, oh goodness! I, I spoke with several uh, lead scientists that uh, wants to uh, analyze this at a, at a lab. Uh, but you know, things disappear. If you let them out of your sight, things do disappear sometimes. Oh yeah. And I, I made it clear: ever who does the analysis of this material I have, I will be there twenty four seven. Yeah, yeah. Plain and simple, it, they're, it's not leaving my sight. I don't blame you. I've already been briefed on that. Uh, I've got some, uh, the guys in my unit are SF, and they have uh, connections in higher places, and they told me right off the bat, don't let it out of your sight, because it will disappear. Were you guys using uh, a fake nuclear artillery shells that night? Uh, yeah, we had the M72s, which is RPG. Okay. It's a, called an M72 law. It fires rocket propelled grenades. Oh yeah, yeah. Everything went down range. When we got fired at, we we let them have it. I mean, sixty cal, fifty cal. I think we had uh, the twenty millimeter, thirty millimeter, something like that. I mean, we had all kind of weapons set up that night, you know, for the training. Yeah. And it was all live rounds. And when we got fired on, you know, what we're going to do? We're going to shoot back, and that's what we did. We we let them have it with everything we had. So let's talk about this because when I contacted Jerry Pippen this morning to ask for John Vasquez's uh, contacts, he was under right. the assumption that that you were in jail, but you you were detained the other day. Can you talk about that? Yes, sir. I went down to Fort Benning, back to the range. Uh, I was only there just a few minutes, probably fifteen minutes. Next thing I know, I see these two vehicles pull up, military police. Uh, they tell me, you need to leave, you need to leave now. And uh, they detain me. Uh, they search my vehicle. They search my camera, which I have a regular 
and somatic camera, or Kodak camera, uh, they erased what was on the camera, and I had a high-definition uh, camcorder, and they also uh, erased what was on that. From there, I was taken to the post commander's building. And let me tell you, I got a good butt chewing. I got a real good butt chewing. Then he gets on the phone. I have no idea who he's talking with or anything. And he says, uh, he, he motions for me to come over there with his finger, like, come here. You know, so I walked over and he said, here, they want to talk to you. And I'm thinking, okay. The guy that introduced himself said he was in charge of uh, this investigation. He let me know right quick, like, who he was with, the agency, the NSA. Yeah. He said, I am the supervisor over the NSA. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, I've really screwed up now. <laughs> but uh, he gave me a good talking and told me, he said, look, he said, I'm not threatening you, but there are people out here that would try to harm you and your family. Uh, I said, well, I understand that. Yeah. I said, I, you know, I, I can take care of myself and my family. I'm not worried about that. But the uh, the guys in my unit that I'm, you know, in my unit with, uh, they're there. Uh, matter of fact, uh, even though I'm gone away from my home right now, they is two at my house, one on each end of the house. And they're they're doing it around the clock when I'm at work. Okay. So we, co- we cover each other's butt. We've been in the unit a long time together. Yeah. Well, you know, I spent time at their house, you know, eating dinner, Thanksgiving, Christmas. They'd come to my house. My Our kids play together. Yep. Yeah, they, we really, you know, cover each other's butt in a situation like this where somebody threatens to har- harm my family or me. I, I don't take that lightly. Another thing about this, the, the helicopter that was down that night was never reported to the FAA, correct? You no. Know, that's really what pissed me off, man. I mean, when you get a, a, a aircraft that goes down, and then the FAA has refused access. Something is wrong with that picture. Something is seriously wrong. Yeah. The FAA was denied entrance on that military base, and I don't understand that. Because I know for a fact when a craft goes down, it has to be investigated. Plain yeah. and simple. Yep. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. Yeah. And it was not. It was not investigated. Now, as you said, your your current home there, um, it's, uh, well, wait, is it Fort McClellan that's really active these days that you have filmed objects at? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, what I've seen over my truck, uh, with a night vision camera I have, high definition, yes, sir, I, you, you would not believe, <coughs> excuse me, what I had videoed out here. You would not believe it. Orbs bouncing across the trees. On the ground, uh, a triangle-shaped craft that hovered over my truck for 45 minutes. I even posted that video on my uh, page there. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. You can't fake that. Yeah. No, there's no way. There's no CGI or nothing. I'm out here. You know, and the other guys are hollering at me. Uh, Sergeant Major, you, you need to look over your truck. And I said, what are you talking about? You need to see what's over your truck. So I get out of the truck and I look up and I see it. So I grab my camera. I keep my camera with me all the time. Because we have a lot of people come in out here that are civilians. They come out here and and do crazy things on the ranges, yeah. uh, try to poach deer and stuff like that. So I always keep the camera, you know, to justify why we, we detain them or hold them or handcuff them. And, you know, video don't lie when, it, when you have to go to court. Yeah, I see the craft right now. I'm looking at it. That's some amazing footage. Oh, yes, sir. I wish yes, everybody sir. else could see it, but it's a Facebook video, and they'd have to be your friend to see it. So. Yes, sir. <clears throat> that's that's amazing. Where does this go from here? Um, are you trying to, to continue this to get this all uh, out in oh, public yeah. the right way? That's, that's your oh, yes, bottom sir. line. Yeah, uh, I've just been trying to, you know, dig up every avenue. Cause, you know, wh- when I take this to be analyzed, I want the best of the best to do it. You know, yeah. People that have done this before, uh, I've been contacted. Oh, Lord, how many labs have called me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, other other people that want to fund this lab. Uh, yeah, honestly, you have to make sure there's no switch out. You know what I mean? They can switch this out with something and say, yeah. "Oh, it's just a aluminum alloy." Right. And uh, the descriptions of it are very reminiscent to Roswell material that uh, Jesse Marcel 
uh, scene. Right. You know? Very well, I, well, I guess I can tell you because, you know, he's no longer alive. Yeah. I do have I do have Ken Folk at work at NASA. Okay. Well, or did. He was there 35 years. He's retired now from NASA. His name is Rotten Mansell. He was kin to the Mansell on my mama's side. And uh, you would not believe some uh, of uh, the videos that he sends me of uh, the uh, International Space Station. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, sir. You would not have believed I've, some, I've of, uh, some of what they've got on video. <laughs> I've seen some of it. Um, uh, people listening just have to look up uh, the N NASA case for UFOs in the 90s. Uh, a NASA live stream to a public service station. I mean, live, right. and it was all recorded, and they found some insane things up there. Oh and yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sure. Sir. I'm sure what you've seen was even crazier. I mean, if anybody watches this and come back and say they don't believe in UFOs, they're crazy. Oh yes, it was. Uh, they can look up uh, Apollo 11 uh, UFOs with yeah. Buzz Aldrin. You know, was uh, uh -huh. Apollo 11. Uh, they actually videoed. UFOs facing them in the capsule, and then when they did land on the moon, they were observed by UFOs at that time. It, it's a uh, matter of fact, I posted it on YouTube. So anybody wants to see it, it's on there. Okay. Or you can go to Disclosure TV. I put it on there also. Now we got a lot of people saying, why isn't this on CNN? You have been contacted by the History oh, Channel by yeah. Sci Fi. Oh, yeah. You know, it was on CNN, Headline News, Fox News, so NBC it was. News, NBC. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was on there. Oh, yeah, it was on there. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, it's it's hard to get any rest during the day because my phone is ringing constantly. <laughs> I am serious. The only way I can get any sleep is to cut it off, and I hate to do that, but, yeah. I mean, when, when you work a long shift like this, 12 hours is a long time. And when you you get off your tired, you're wore out. You're ready to you know lay down and get you some sleep. Yeah, I understand. And so, yeah, you know, my phone I, rings twenty four seven. I've been contacted. Uh, <laughs> I've been contacted by uh, Sci Fi Channel, History Channel. Uh, unbelievable at the people that it's wanting to make a movie about this. Yeah. And I said, look, I, I'm not in it to make any money, any gratuities or anything like. That. I just want the truth to be told. That's it. What our government is doing behind our back, and I know for a fact what they're doing. I know exactly. When when they put me on the phone with the NSA and tell me I better watch my back, something could happen to my family or me, that's a threat. And I don't take that lightly. No, not at all. Nope. People are asking, you know, where's the evidence, where's the YouTube links, and, um, you well, know, the, you, I, you're not letting this stuff out right away. I see you do have the, this video that he has on Facebook is incredible. So you have to have a lot of great stuff. Um uh, oh yes, sir. I do waiting. have I do have pictures. Okay. Uh, the 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 evidence is buried in an unknown location. It's been there since seventy seven. It's uh, sealed in a in a uh, box, and it's in the ground. And there's only two people that knows where it's it's at. It's me and my son. Which is, my son is in Hawaii in the regular army. He is the only one that knows besides me where this is at. I okay. have actually showed it to him and reburied it. And I do have pictures. I do have pictures, but you know, if I post it, I'm going to get all these nuts come out of the woodwork because I've already had a bunch of calls. You're a traitor to your damn country. You should yeah. be court-martialed and all yeah. this crap. I said, oh, whatever, and I just hang up. Yeah, there's certain people that think, you know, that this is being kept secret for a good reason. One person wants to know, what do you think these are? I mean, that's that's what you're trying to find out, so how would you know, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, when I when I uh, when I talked with Stan Freeman and I described what I had to him, he said, "Oh, we've had that for a while." I said, like, "What? Oh yeah, we've had it for a while." Okay, <laughs> it really blows me away, you know. He said, "Yeah, things like this, we we've known about it for years." And then he told me, he said, if you would read the Bible, I said, I know the Bible, but back yeah. back and forth, oh, yeah. where it talks about e Ezekiel yeah. being took up. And, and you know, in, in this uh, ring or whatever it was, yeah, and, and that's in the Bible, yeah, yeah. And also the Sumerians, yeah, on their their pottery, it shows depictions of UFOs. Oh yeah, yeah. We're all very familiar with that the ancient alien oh, theory. Yeah. Um, yeah, we look forward to to keeping up on this case, and uh, it's just going to be interesting. Um, 
I don't want to keep you too right. long. I thank you for your time coming on here and uh, talking with us, and, and we'll be in touch if, if the next step of this, uh, you know, something else happens big. I hope uh, we can get you back on and, and talk a little bit more about this, but I appreciate your time tonight, and, uh, you know, I'll let you get back to your duty. Oh, that's no problem. Yeah, I just I just want the truth to be known. I don't want any money, any gratuities. I just want to be known what's going on. Okay. Well, I thank you for for your for your time and uh, yeah, thank you, James. You too, buddy, and I appreciate it. All right, take care. Hey, hey also, uh, all the veterans out there, thank you for your service to your country. Yes. thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, take care, James. You too, sir. Yep. Bye. Bye, bye. All right. Yeah, we we uh, have some veterans tuning in in Iraq that they like to tune into our network, and we thank them. Uh, currently tonight, uh, he is not in danger. Uh, I've seen the, the comment posted. <clears throat> uh, when he was detained, he was told there's people out there that could uh, threaten his life. Don't go anywhere. Up next, we have John Velasquez. Vasquez. He is going to tell his story right here. Right after this break. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Hey guys, Jamie Havikin here for Inception Radio Network, letting you know we are looking for advertisers. If you have a product you would like to advertise on Inception Radio Network on the air or on the website or both, let us know. Send us an email, Inception Radio Network at gmail.com. That's Inception Radio Network at gmail.com. We offer banner ads, audio ads, and so much. More contact us, Jamie at Inception Radio Network at gmail.com. Hey guys, Jamie Havikin here for Project White Paper right here on the Inception Radio Network. Make sure you check them out Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time as host Chase Kletsky and Michael Rambacher interview. The best guest in ufology and paranormal from around the world. That's Project White Paper right here on the Inception Radio Network, InceptionRadioNetwork.com, Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll see you there. Are you tired of listening to the same old talk radio? Tune in to the Joyner Report every Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time with Angela Joyner for some thought-provoking conversation. The Joyner Report on the Inception Radio Network every Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Hey guys, Jamie Havikin here from Inception Radio and Inception Radio Network just reaching out and giving you thanks for all the show hosts here at Inception Radio Network to you that have donated for the cause. We rely on these donations to continue to bring you the truth and your apology and the paranormal. Thank you to all of you that have contributed to the network. If you haven't done so, please consider. Go to InceptionRadioNetwork.com, look on the sidebar for the donate button. Any amount is well appreciated, and we thank you. For Inception Radio and Inception Radio Network, take care. All right, welcome back to Inception Radio. I'm your host, Jamie Havikin, and uh, co-host David Riles is still on. And we just finished listening to uh, Command Sergeant Major James Norton, who is not active duty, who is on reserves right now at Fort McClellan on, uh, on, on post as he gave his interview. Um, this is going to be a long show. We're going over tonight. 
because all the information we have to bring to you. We still have uh, uh, John Vasquez, who we're going to talk to right now. And then, when that's over, we're going to go to break and come back with Jim Tierney. And we're going to talk, talk with him about his new website, all of the amazing stuff he's doing with his art, his show, all kinds of stuff. So uh, that's what we have forward to tonight. We're definitely going to go over. So uh, let's talk to John. John. Hey, John. Jamie Havikin from Inception Radio. Oh, how are you doing, sir? I just got a call from Gary just now. <laughs> You still oh, talking? Just, uh, who's that? You still talking to Jerry? Yeah, he just gave me a call just now. Oh, okay. He told me about, about you calling me, and I said, sure, you know, no problem with that. I, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of things going on right now. It's like wildfire, tsunami. <laughs> I've been trying to get a hold of everybody and you know, finding out what you know what uh, the news is going to be saying about this middle object that. Uh, yeah. Command Sergeant Major Jim Norton has. And, uh, yeah, well, this, a lot of, uh, this started Friday. I, I interviewed uh, Paul Dale Roberts, and he, he was mentioning the case, and I didn't make too much of it until yeah. yesterday. I seen, and, you know, it's everywhere. So I decided yeah. to, to get James's number, and I called him, and uh, <clears throat> I talked to him for about a half hour. He said uh, he was on duty at the time in the armory, but he talked to me for like a half hour. Said that he was called up, um, that he was out out outside filming, and uh, I don't know one of the, one of the base people brought him up and uh, told him they knew what he was doing. He better stop. They he said they warned him, um, but as far as I know, he hasn't gotten in any trouble yet. And uh, I asked him, I said, are you, you sure you want to continue talking? I said, you're still active duty. And he says, certainly. So, I don't know. He told me, he asked my number. He's supposed to call me today. I was hoping to, you know, if, if he wants to talk. I mean, he says he's not he's he's not backing down at all. Um, try to get his story out. I know he's on the Kevin Smith show. And, uh. I'm just wondering because I, I watched um, I watched your your video uh, the incident at Fort Benning and uh, do you remember James Norton from back then? Oh gosh, thirty years ago, he tells me he talked to me and we're I mean this is a huge base you know and he took, he was with Third Battalion I was with First. Okay. I'm on Sand Hill, but if you did talk to me that night when this incident occurred. It, it was like uh, a wildfire. It was everywhere. Yeah. Up and down the post. So if I uh, if I bumped into him or said something, I may have because I talked to. I mean, I was practically yelling. You know, with these things happening, I was yelling at everybody. Let's you know get get armed and get you know, alert. And, uh, ever seen? Ever see about? Ever hear three hundred people um, walking across the river? And somebody said snake. Yeah. Did we hear all the screaming going on at one time? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wild. <laughs> really wild. But that, ha that happened that one night when, when we got uh, shot at. A lot of us got burned. That's what happened. And there was down chopper that was on fire. I remember that. And I, I contacted Fort Rutgers, Alabama, and they had a, a, a uh, classified document. They declassified it. It was right there at Charlie Company. And James came out and said, hey, there were two deceased pilots also involved. And I go, oh, God. That one I didn't know. That was new. Yeah. When 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 did you become aware of uh, James uh, with this information? Well, um, I came across uh, my publisher, Bruce Stephen Holmes. He's in Santa Barbara. And uh, he told me about James and... Uh, it was really up to me to decide if I wanted to uh, contact him and talk to him and, you know, see what he had to say about this. And he was at Fort Benning and, you know, on and on and on. I found out he's command sergeant major. He used to be a buck sergeant back then yeah. in 1977. So, yeah, um, I, I talked to him and, you know, he's determined. I know, I know, 
I know kind of well, very well about uh, Command Sergeant Major. I mean, James, you know, he's got his foot on something, he's not going to let go. We just had uh, a guy on a couple of weeks ago who um, was in, he was in the Air Force. He was an E-5. He was involved with, um, he was involved with uh, an NBC crew, cleanup crew. He says he cleaned up uh, quite a few crash sites. And <clears throat> what he kind of says kind of corroborated what James said. James says he had like this this measles that, that was of un, unknown origins. And, and this guy, Viper, I know his real name, but he's going by a code name, um, pretty much confirms that, that he contracted the same type of thing that he still suffers with today. It, it flares up from yeah, his legs yeah. down. I know what he's talking about because uh, when I look into this for the last 18 years, I found an article that was written by the Columbus Ledger paper in Columbus, Georgia, and I'm in touch with uh, Mr. Uh, ben Wright. He's a writer there. And uh, they wrote an article uh, about a measles outbreak striking post troops and they were talking about us. And 14 people were hospitalized, but I think there were a lot more people hospitalized. Yeah. And it came down to like a red mark, like a burn mark, with sort of like yellow spotches here and there, unusual burn. It, it was burning. I know. I got hit by one of those little balls of light. Man, that, it was weird. I mean, it, you know, a lot of us got when we got hit by these things, it will knock us out for about an hour. That's what happened. And during this, um, what do you call it, scrimmages with whatever they, whatever yeah. they were, I, I, I heard a chopper coming down, right? And uh, this was before I got burned. A chopper coming down, and I knew uh, they were going to fire it into the forest area because if something was out there in the forest and we, we knew something was rushing all back and forth between the trees taking cover, we had binoculars so we could see something running across the other trees back and forth, back and forth, and there was something else. Uh, I don't know what they were, but at that time I didn't know what they were. When the chopper was coming down, some ball of light just struck this thing in the windshield, right, and it immersed around the windshield. And what happened next, it dissipated. I knew then that the chopper was going to hit, hit the ground real hard. And I could hear the co-pilot screaming at the pilot, Take cover, sir, take cover. And then, boy, that chopper would bounce about four or five times trying oh to get God. control on the ground. And then it was a, a Huey chopper, one of those choppers that's, um, that were used for Vietnam War. And I got Charlie Company with me to help me out to go get the cap. It was a major and his pilot, co pilot, and a gunner out of the chopper. And we did that. And they all stand there, like, came out of the chopper, like, there in the days or something. I had to tell the major, you're okay, we're going to pick, take you back to the gully where we're at, you know? Yeah. And he was, he was saying, oh, good man, good man. Well, he wasn't there. Whatever that thing hit him, hit them, it just kind of made him look like they were, you know, do, hallucinating or something. Hmm. It was weird. They, they had a weird look on their faces. I could see it right now when we were, you know, yeah, that, that's. back. I can't imagine going through something like that, and then you got to go to sleep and dream about it all these years. How, how big was the range you guys were on? Oh, gosh, you were huge. It's 1st Battalion Post, and, okay. and you got Alpha, Bravo, Charlie Company, and Delta Company. Echo was on the other side of the, um, uh, the other side, north side of, the, of us, and uh, I mean, it's just a huge, like, um, two football field size, you know. You and, think you uh, think they knew something was going to happen during this test, or do you just think it happened? They had no knowledge of it. Well, the first part is that uh, when this happened on the first part was September second. Um, pretty much our first day there, and everybody's being acquainted with each other. And we're supposed to get uh, one of the sergeants, Sergeant Major, um, not Sergeant Major, but Sergeant Santini, David Santini. Buck Sergeant back in 77. Uh, he came into our barracks and told us, hey guys, you know, well, not him, say, hey guys, but he said, listen to this, you guys are going to be out in mandatory training, uh, mandatory parade formation at 730. 
be there or we're going to come look for you. <laughs> One of those kind of things. So uh, when 7.30 came around, we were instructed to be out there in this parade, and we were out there for about half an hour. And this is September 2nd. And, and 7.30, we're standing out there for about a half an hour. And um, all of a sudden, somebody said, it's kind of crying. He said, hey, what is that up there? You know, I didn't pay no attention. I, I thought he was talking about some, something else. And uh, and he said it again. He said, well, what is that up there? And, well, the curiosity got the best of me. And so I kind of looked, and I looked around. Oh, I see the stars. And so I told him, hey, oh, I see the stars. And he kind of turned around and pointed at this one star on the right side of the sky. And he said, take a look. So I did. It was just cluster of stars. Within 10 seconds, this one star moved. I said, wait a minute, what is this? You know, and, and, and the way it moved, imagine you holding an ice cube in your hand and the stainless steel on, a, on yeah. the floor there. Sliding. Right? Yeah. Flat, smooth, real yeah. smooth, like it was part of the sky. Yep. And it stopped. It went away. Come back. And moved again across the sky, stopped, and went away, and it came, and it came back and started moving again. And by then, uh, I think Sergeant Santini was telling all of us to stand at attention because the captain, the captain was just walking away from his building and stepping onto his podium to make this speech, right, to tell us what our training course was going to be. And during his speech, I hear this rushing noise to my left. So I, look, I lean back just a little bit to see what's going on, and I see Charlie coming in. Someone is standing. The others are breaking out. I couldn't figure out why they're breaking out for it. And I, I looked up, and I said, oh, my God. It, it's bright light coming down a dirt road. Pure bright white light. It has kind of a circular blue outline onto it because it's getting dark. It's already dark. Yeah. And I thought it was, oh, it's a chopper, you know? So I leaned forward to the guy who was saying something about the star in the sky, he's a tall guy. And I looked up, and he's asleep. Wow. He's standing asleep. Now, and I looked across, you know, I, I leaned forward a little bit more, and this bright, intense light was heading our way. And I don't know what happened here, but I guess I became unconscious for a few seconds when I came to the alert. I couldn't move. I was standing there frozen. I turned my right. I turned to my right and I saw my buddies and this bunch of other guys standing around. The others were running, taking off. I told my buddy to come back and help me. He did, and we, he, you know, he pulled me away from where I was standing and we started running. I told him, "Run, run, run, take over," you know. And I, and I wanted I wanted to see the captain where he's at, and we, we ran over to where the captain is, and there he was, standing behind this podium. He was asleep. So I yelled out, out, out loud to I knew I could have woke up everybody. <laughs> you know, and uh he didn't wake up. He was still sleeping uh -huh. standing there. Yeah. So by this time my buddy was turned all the way around and he's looking looking at whatever it is behind me. And his face looked like he just saw a ghost. So I grabbed his uh, collar and his shoulder and I shook him real hard and I said, Don't look at it, don't look at it and he came to and said, What's going on? Like he didn't know. And I said, just, just run, just run, take cover, run. So we started running, and uh, we passed the first building, and something else happened there. And we came to the second one, and uh, we, uh, our names were called down at the far end of the second building, so we ran over there, and there's about three or four other guys underneath the building hiding, or co taking cover, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, we got down there, and we started arguing about, you know, this and that, what's going on here, and... You know, we thought it's the Russians, it's the Russians. You know, they, they start to the mm -hmm. Back then, in 77, you got, you know, all kinds of Russian pictures all over the wall, and everybody's talking about you know, Russian invasion, the Russians, yeah. after, you know, all this stuff. And uh, when we're arguing about this, all of a sudden, Sergeant Santini, we saw him again, and this time he's running, uh, running, and he's flopping his arm up and down like he's about to fly, and he's screaming, take cover, take cover, and he started to run. We lost him at the, the second building we were laying on on the ground at, and uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, second floor of the first building, ball of white light, about the size of uh, a melon, swooped down to his height, he's about, sorry, he's about 5'11", 
flew down to his height and took off, went after him. And all we heard, all we heard was a, a slap and a thump, right? So one, I told one of the guys to go down and crawl over to find out what Sergeant Antini is. And when he came back, he, he told us, hey, he's out on the pavement. He's not moving. So, you know, we we're start talking about M sixteen, words words of live ammunition and we're still arguing and cursing at each other. By now we're hearing screaming going on. The formation. All the guys we left behind. We started screaming. From Alpha Garbo, Charlie, and down to Delta. I mean, these guys are really screaming it. You ever heard a man scream before in high pitched sound? No. It's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It's like something was eating them. Yeah. And and then and, and, um, you know we're we're all panicked now. We're in panic. We started really getting at each other. We're about to start a fight with each other. We're trying to say where's the M16s. We're still gonna get armed, you know. By now when we're arguing each other. We lost uh, some focus on what's going on out there. By now there has a big huge light on the other side of uh, on this first building, on the other side, mm -hmm. front side, second floor. It started cruising like it was looking for something. It was huge. It was, this light was so intense. It silhouetted all the flames, the beams, everything of the building. This light was coming right, uh, right through it. And it was cruising like real slow and looking for it. There was no wind. I know it was no chopper. Yeah. It would have made a noise at least, but this thing wasn't. And, it, and, and on the first building, there... There's about four other guys in each lane there, and we're pounding the ground. We're telling them to wake up, you know? They didn't. They're out. You can see them. This light is so intense. They started cruising around this first building and coming toward us, and one of my buddies, Alan, said, what are you going to do, John? What are we going to do, John? I said, I don't know, you know, whatever it is coming our way. So I, I said, well, let's crawl to the center of the building here. It's really dark can't see much, but then this thing kept coming across. So we started crawling to, to the middle of the building, and it was really dark. And when this thing came to the front, it stopped. Huge light. God, it, it silhouetted the whole building. It was like the I size mean, of a car now at this time? Uh, I'm sorry? How big was it at this time? Like a car or a helicopter? Uh, a Volkswagen. Okay. Okay size of a Volkswagen, and it's bright, intense light. I think it's still uh, just sitting there. It was just sitting there. Yeah. And and I and you know, all of a sudden something weird happened. I'm hearing this female voice, an like echo, far away echo, metallic, right? And it's telling me it's okay. Don't be afraid. Come out. I'm hearing this, and I'm, I'm asking the guys, hey, do you guys hear this? Do you guys hear this? And, and they're looking at me like, oh, shit, John, something's wrong with John. Yeah. You know? And I hear it again, same thing. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Come on. So I tell the guy, hey, listen, I'm going to call out and see what's going on. And, and you know what? These guys are all shaking their hands going, yeah, let's ask, go, let's go. Let's go find out, John. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I started crawling. When I started crawling away from him, my hands would disappear. That was a weird. Uh, wow. That was weird. My hands would just vanish. I mean, I'm, I could feel the ground and all, but my hands would disappear. Invisible. And maybe because of the light was so intense, you know, bright, it would disappear into the light or something. And my hands would disappear. I crawled out, crawled uh, across the pavement, sidewalk, went up this grassy wall. I stood up, I looked to my left, and this huge, intense light is sitting there in front of me. And I'm to my left side, bottom, something small, right, scurry right back into the light again. I don't know what that was. But it's something a little, little and weird. So, yeah, so what I did next, I tried to shield my eyes with my left hand and I got hit by something on my left shoulder. It sounded like a fuse being blown. Mm -hmm. And I and I go down, right? And one of my other friends, Hackett, is reaching out for me and screaming my last name, come back and come back here, something like that. And something else hit my back. 
I was out. No. How long I was out, I don't know. But when I could have became aware of what's happening, there was somebody on my left and the other one on my right, and they're both telling me to keep my eyes closed. And what I felt like, like I was going on a escalator up. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can't, I started opening my eyes a little bit, and I could see a bunch of other guys, other people like myself, coming up, the, the, coming up, you know? And when I looked, and when I looked straight up, there's a door opening, bright light, and we're heading to it. And I panicked, really panicked. I had to. I thought we I were going to get eaten. That's the feeling I had. I don't know why. Yeah. Strange. So, within that time frame, I don't know how long I was in this room or whatever, that same, that same female voice I could hear again, and she was asking me, how do you feel? So I'm telling myself, how do I feel? The kind of question is after what yeah. we're going through, you know. And uh, well, she said, don't worry, we'll take care of you. Of course, there's all kinds of examination going on. After that, I guess after that, what they've done, um, I kind of looked to my left and I opened my eyes a little bit because they were telling me, don't open your eyes, what I did. And I could see rows. Rows and rows of soldiers laying on uh, metal slabs, and we're all levitated. And this this room we we're in, it was the size of a mall. Huge. Wow. When you came to, were you were you in the same position as you were when you first? Uh, uh, were struck when you when it sounded like a fuse was blowing. Do you believe that that they were able to take these people without their physical body and then put them back in, or do you believe they actually took the the physical body up there? That a good that's a good question. I think it, I think it is the physical body that our body was taken up there. Okay, and they did a total examination. And uh, during that examination, I became aware of what's happening a little bit. And after year, when she came back to me, she pointed her finger at me and told me to go to sleep, so I did. When I came, I, I became awake or started realizing I was, I was someplace. I opened my eyes and there's something standing in front of me, something ugly, God. Big eyes, bald head, bumpy, like he had mumps on it, mm-hmm. right? And he was telling me, looking into his eyes, and I, hey, I tell him, well, I'm not going to look into your eyes. I don't know who you are. You know? Yeah. This strange looking thing just standing in front of me. And he kept saying, it would help you. It would help you. He didn't say it worked. It was right in my mind. Strange. And uh, the slight pressure, the slight pressure on your forehead was telling me, it will help you. It will help you. So I said, fine. First thing that three images came, to, came into my mind. One was that I was standing in front of an ocean. No land or nothing for thousands of miles. I just stand in the ocean. I don't know what that meant. The second was I'm standing in a room and there's a huge viewpoint or television I'm looking at and I see a planet being destroyed. Which planet? I don't know. But I had the impression that it was their planet and their and the planet was being destroyed. So what Yeah. They were looking for another. That actually, they were looking for another, and I think they found it here. Wow. That's my opinion on that. Yeah. I may be wrong. And the third one is I see a humanoid face, all pale, like uh, paste, white paste. He had a long nose, slit on mouth, eyes was like mercury, and had a dressing on his head white dress so that was he was a, a creature I was a humanoid creature and that was over with I, I came uh, I woke up I guess and, and I, I'm standing at formation again like everybody else was there mm-hmm. formation and my buddy was standing next to me 
However, this is a strange part. Him and I were standing at the second line. We're in a fourth line now. We were moved. Oh, and Sar Sergeant Newcook, this other sergeant, Newcook was telling us, okay, you guys, get out of here. Go back to your barracks. And I'm, I'm asking him, hey, hey, you know, Sergeant, what happened to that uh, speech the captain was going to give us? We didn't hear it. He just kept telling us, go, sleep, sleep, leave the break, go back to your barracks. So we started walking, and I lost my balance. So did everybody else. Everybody fell down. One by one. When I, came, when I stood up, you know, I started walking. I got sick. So did everybody else, too. They got sick. So we were spinning a little bit. Yeah. And then we started walking back and to our barracks, and I looked at my watch. My watch said it stopped at 7.30. And my other buddy says 3.30. And other guy says 4.45. Uh, all our watches stopped and we started walking back to our barracks and uh, this is a weird, bizarre, bizarre, bizarre guy. The guys who were in the barracks that were acting really bizarre. Oh my God. Their behaviors were all out of whack. You know? Yeah. And, and, and that night, some of the guys went to sleep with flashlights on and covered themselves with blankets. Others are popping out of the bed screaming, I see a face on the wall. And we're all kind of looking at him like, well, what's going on? Is, is all of this affected with this? And that night, one of them still uh, got up, opened his locker, and urinated inside his locker. And the latrine is right next to him. Wow. It sound, yeah. That sounds like they... they uh took the opportunity to do a mass abduction, you know, instead of taking one person here and there, uh, they had a field of 1,300 people that they could, you know, all do at once. They did? Yeah. <laughs> because that morning, the next morning, Saturday, this was a Friday night, September 2nd was a Friday night, but next morning, I didn't wake up until 10 o'clock when Jones came out and said, John, got to get up at 10 o'clock. And I, I said, wait a minute, 10 o'clock, you know, I never break from this breakfast. Yeah. 5 o'clock is breakfast in the military, so I, you know, I didn't miss that. That was easy. No problem with that, you know, 7 to eat in the morning. But I woke up at 10. I got dressed, went downstairs, went to the back of the building, and there's everybody sitting on, on uh, benches, picnic benches. Everybody sitting around, not saying a word. I get all stoned or something and smoking too much drugs or whatever. Can't say a word. Or they're dead, you know. Minds are all gone or something. I say, hey, did I see you guys standing there last night? No. Huh. No, you know. Do you remember anything that's going on? Something happened. Because I had the feeling, I think everybody had the same feeling that I did because something did happen, kind of sort of a residue, you know? Yeah. Something happened to us. My, my, myself was uh, sort of ringing, and, and my skin was like goosebumps all over. I, I don't know, it was strange as God. But we couldn't learn, remember anything about what happened to us last night. Nothing. Nothing at all. So did, did, uh, Apparently, James Norton must, you know, everybody has different levels of memory. Like you said, some remembered nothing at all, uh, what you remember. And then James, uh, his story is very similar. Um, he says that, that he's seen a triangular-shaped UFO show up as well, you know, when this was all going on. So he may have just been, you know, taken up after you, and he's seen a triangle-shaped well, if, that, if that's the, the thing they use, that, that must be bigger than the other ones because, yeah. you know, if they're going to carry up all of us, that's 1,300 guys on this field. Yeah. Great field. Yeah. So they must use a, a larger size uh, object or whatever, you know. These little ones are just like scouts. Yeah, I've seen them. Um, 
We li- I live down here next to McDill Air Force Base, and, and we have military night vision, and we do sky watching. And uh, we've actually seen them um, fly over on numerous occasions, and uh, we flash at them, and they flash yeah. back at us. This is oh. numerous. I, I got the, I got all this on film. Um, uh, do you feel when you're there? Do you feel like it's there uh, somehow a feeling of uh, yeah? These things are uh, being Connected. controlled and yeah. they're looking at you. Because I have a I have a friend who we really only see him when he's down here, and uh, he can almost say, you know, I feel him in this part, and they'll come out and fly over us, and. Uh, uh-huh. You know, we'll flash them most of the time. Uh, one time we had a huge one come over us that was kind of going, uh, uh, coming right off the golf, but it was wobbling. And all three of us just got chills right down our spine. Yeah, goose on. Yep, and then another one, smaller one, shot up next to it, and they kept going east. But uh, I'm going to think twice now about flashing them. <laughs> I would, I I, I wouldn't uh, because I remember we're all of us having this. Uh, oh man, it's still in me too. God, so I can hear people. You know, I could hear other people when they talk that something happened to them. Yeah. You know, something happened to them. God, it's something. It really is something. So did 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 you end up with um uh this this measles case that uh. James says he ended up with almost like a, he says he had like measles from head to toe, but they couldn't, he says that top scientists came in and they couldn't diagnose it. Yeah, well, you know, when I, um, as far as what I know about this measles, I know they took us out to the hospital and they kept sending us off measles. When it measles it wasn't, there were no measles. I mean, when I, I had to make sure that what I was talking about was either not measles or something else. So I contacted the Columbus Health Department. They had no records of this measles. Hmm. Nobody was going in, nobody was going out because it was a uh, quarantine, so to speak, and at the first uh, battalion post or the whole Fort Benning area. So w- whatever it was, you know, uh, it wasn't contagious. It was a burn. That's what it was. You get burned by one of those things that will knock you out. It's like a, a stun gun. Yeah. Let me turn this down. It's going to come on. All right. So did these did, did this leave marks? Like the next day, were you able to look in these areas and, and see marks where you thought you were hit? Uh, yeah, I had to make sure that was, there was no other marks. I mean, I had to look at my body and then make sure there was nothing unusual about my uh, problem. It's just that, uh, the, that, you know, just a red mark with yellow spotches on it. As far as I, 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 as far as I, excuse me, as far as I remember. Little mm-hmm. tiny yellow spotches. So when did you, uh, um, Become inactive. In inactive? Yeah. What year? Uh, I was discharged back in nineteen um, seventy-nine, April thirteenth, nineteen seventy-nine. Okay. And this 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 date lines up with the same occasion that that you're talking about, September fourteenth of seventy-seven. Yeah, well, September 2nd is when all of us got abducted, and, uh, of course, Monday came around, and they took us out to the woods to keep us away from uh, the 1st Battalion Post, and I don't know what happened to the other company. We left them at the post, but they might have took them somewhere else. When we came back, it was almost, yeah, September 14th, we got off the the truck, and... um, Went back into our barracks and it seemed very nice. This stuff, this stuff happened. I mean, the lights in the barracks just started flashing like a strobe light, and we—I knew it wasn't us. We thought at first it was, you know, the gas and electric company having problems, but it yeah. wasn't gas. I know it wasn't. So all of us got together and walked away from the, the post, and uh, 
sure enough, we got into this uh, firefight that night. Was the Secretary of the Army there that you recall? Yeah, yeah. Alexander James, oh, Clifford L. Alexander, he was there. He was, he was there in the morning, I think. Yeah, he wasn't there, there in the morning. He had a, uh, what do you call it, um, a meeting with uh, the National Press Club. Okay. And uh, I found that out. Did he say that said the, that the test was successful? I'm sorry, what was did he say that the weapons test was successful? Because you guys were out there to test the JAL system, right? The Joint Attack Weapon System? Yeah, that was uh, the A-10 airplane. Okay. Uh, it was under a project called JAWS, the acronym for Joint Attack Weapon System. And uh, the Secretary of the Army was explaining to the National Press Club that, is that it has to do something with our future plan with um, military combat or something like that. Okay. So, um, did you guys have yeah, was, did you have starlight scopes on the range that night? Uh, some of us had uh, scopes. Um, I think they did. I'm not sure about that, but the Green Berets brought some. I think yeah, the Green yeah. Berets brought some. Okay. And uh, the chopper that w was there was Kiwis, uh, and the other one was I think uh, a little bit more smaller uh, version of the choppers. I forgot the name. Oh, God. Yeah, I've seen in a it. while. <laughs> yeah, I just got the name of the, those smaller ones. Yeah, it goes around faster than the UEs. Yeah, what are they called? Uh, oh man, Hawk, something, something, Hawk. something bird? No, little bird. Yeah, yeah. something. I, <laughs> I forgot what it was right there, gosh. But I know we had them. The little tiny choppers, about two seaters. Those were buzzing all over the place. Mike Hawks or something like that. Black Shark, um, let's see, yeah, I'm just looking, the Alouette EC-135. Yeah, Apaches? You think yeah, Apaches? well, they said they have uh, Apaches, Stallions, Stallions are bigger. Yeah, Apaches, I think those Apaches, little tiny ones. Yeah, I know the little birds are like the tiny, tiny ones that they just drop off special forces with real, real small. But, yeah, uh, we still, and then we, we had the Hueys. Yeah. Uh, my grandma actually worked at Sikorsky uh, as an experimental uh, engine uh, mechanic there. Oh. Back yeah, back in the early days. She, uh, she passed away uh, this year, but uh, it's oh, amazing God. to think that uh, she worked on helicopter engines. Um, so... You've talked to James. What what has he said to you? Well, when I spoke to James, that uh, he tells me he was there and, and that uh, he has a metal piece and he picked up and um, they had uh, two incidents that occurred, or at least three. He mentioned three. One was back in '77. There was another one in '86, and the last one, what he told me, was in. 80, no, which one was it? 82 and then 86 was the last. No, wait a minute, 86 and 2006, I'm sorry. The, two, the one in 2006, I found out that there was an object uh, crashed right outside Fort Benning in Columbus, uh, yeah, Columbus City. Okay. The fire department, the police department, Channel 9 News, and FAA. Also, with uh, personnel from Fort Benning, picked up this object and sent it back to Fort Benning, and James was in charge of that. So he, he's got pieces of metals of whatever it is that he has right now, and uh, whatever happened to this object was uh, put into a um, uh, white plane. Whitewashed or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no whitewashed plane with, with no numbers. Yeah. yeah, no numbers, nothing. Just white plane, put it back there. And I I have a guy who uh, I know quite well who worked at Wright Patterson, and uh, this is this is you know very close to this time where they had some jets come in and had a orange fireball actually following these things that stopped at the end of the runway. 
Which is strange. You know, a lot of people think that a lot of the stuff went to Wright Patterson. They may have, but uh, this is just an interesting case, and it's blowing up. And uh, uh, this this one is moving fast. I mean, really fast. I, I know I wrote a book about it, mentioning at Fort Benning. I'm on Amazon.com, but it moved along, you know, for months and months and months. And all I have been trying to do is uh, find the people who were there. And all of a sudden, this happens, and it's like. Phew, Ooh, man. Yeah. Wildfire. Yeah. I mean, it's hitting everywhere. It's hitting everywhere. I think there's, you know, the, the Internet is just, it, it's growing so fast, and there's more shows out there, and people. Oh, my gosh, and, like a monster. Yeah, and I, I talked to James for a half an hour yesterday, and, yeah. uh, you know, I told him about my other buddy in the Air Force who, who disclosed all of his information a couple of weeks ago on Bill Burns' show, A Future Theater, which is also on our network. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, he actually thinks he might know this guy that he goes by. He's always gone by the code name Viper. But, um, you know, he, he basically said that his life was threatened if he continues doing this, that he was filming, and that, uh, you know... Uh, yeah. He has this material somewhere, you know, in an article. They say it's buried in his backyard. He wouldn't bury it on a base. I mean, <laughs> unless you're trying to hide something in plain sight. But um, he said he was out there filming, and that's when they came and said, you can't film. And he said, why? Everybody else films in here. Well, my, my understanding is that when James got uh, detained, um, he took his... A cell phone and whatever else yeah. he had on a person. When I talked and to him yesterday, he says, uh, you know, we're being listened to. And a couple times in a phone call, uh, he kept going out. And yeah. uh, But, but yeah, he was detained, but, he, you know, they, they let him back out. So he's, he was actually on duty at the, uh, uh, at the ammo uh, mm-hmm. place when I was talking to him. So I'm hoping... I'm hoping that uh, he gets back in touch with me today so I can have him on tonight. We can kind of uh, yeah, compare stories and see what happens. Fun. Yeah. So, yeah. is it okay if I use this and play this, your story? Yeah, whatever you want to do, James. Um, I mean, this has already gone far, far yeah, beyond I, my, I know. my reach right now. And, uh, uh, you know, if it helps anybody else or try to find more people that was involved with this incident, that would be great, you know, because there's a lot of guys out there still out there that hopefully they're alive, and uh, they could talk to you and everybody else about this incident at Fort Benny. Yeah. And it's, it's true. I mean, uh, you know, it's been, I mean, since the time I wrote this book and released this book was 2000, this is already 2011, and now it's hitting the nation. Yeah, you, you, might, oh, you might see uh, some big book sales, and it's called Incident at Fort Benning. Yeah, um, it's called Incident at Fort Benning, and it's uh, uh, written by, uh, also, it's, it was an Incident at Fort Benning at Amazon.com. Okay. Now you can find it anywhere, really, Incident at Fort Benning, you know, any bookstore, you can go to any bookstore. You also, you can, uh, oh yeah, by the way, you can also get to hold of uh, Bruce Holmes, Bruce Stephen Holmes, at uh, Timeless Voyager Press. He's okay. my publisher. Yeah, and, and the book is uh, very, very uh, uh, priced to sell it at $12. I'm going to order me a copy. Uh, check it out on Amazon.com, Incident at Fort Bennings by John mm-hmm. Vasquez and yeah. Bruce, Bruce Stephan Holmes as well. So yeah. um, I'll, I'll yeah. post it up. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'll post it up in the uh, in the in the preview for tonight. So yeah, I'll be here. All right, I'm not going away. Yeah, all right, Jane, uh, Jamie, I uh, appreciate your call. You know, and uh, it's good to hear from someone who knows what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it'll be good because my listeners, um, um, I, I got a unique listener base, and I'm sure they've never heard this story before. So um, uh, well, that's the wild one. Yeah, it's the wild one. Uh, I appreciate your time, and we'll we'll keep in touch. All right, we're going to take our break, and we'll be right back with comedian Jim Tierney to uh, finish out the show. We are going over 
tonight. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back in just a second. Feeling a little bit talked out, maybe over-talked? Talk radio can do that to you. Hey, I like talk radio just like everybody else, but I also like music. I have a suggestion for you. Why don't you come over to my new show, The Alien Tarmac? It's a music show. Its genre is alien techno, which is a new genre which I've created. It airs on Thursday nights on the Inception Radio Network at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Pacific Time. I hope to see you there, The Alien Tarmac. Hi folks, Paul Barfoot here for PKW Personal Accounting. I invite you to visit my website and check out all my free accounting programs. PKW Personal Accounting 3.0 for all your personal or household finances. Home Small Business Invoice, a program for billing your goods and services. And Scribe, a program for you songwriters. Catalog and pitch your song lyrics to record companies and publishers. All my programs run under the Paradox Database from the people at Corel, makers of the famous WordPerfect Office Suite, Paradox 11 runtime version, and all my programs are available free of charge at my website. My website address is www.pkwpdoxapps.ca. Hey, the easy way to the freeway is click the link named PKW Paradox Accounting Applications on the Inception Radio Network website. Hi, Bob Tarmac for MJ'sHealthyWay.com. Are you into vitamins, nutrition, meal replacements, health shakes, uh, keeping your body in good shape, your internal engine going? <laughs> Boy, do I have a perfect place for you. MJ'sHealthyWay.com. They offer the best service and products, and they'll tell you anything you need to know about any product they have to offer. I get all my vitamins, meal replacements, shakes from MJ'sHealthyWay.com. That's spelled M-J-S HealthyWay.com. There's so much more at the website. Go check it out. MJ'sHealthyWay.com. Hi, this is Bob Tarmac. Uh, this is a radio show that I listen to every single week. In fact, <laughs> I like the show so much, I listen to it twice a week. It's Inception Radio with Jamie Havigan. He airs every Tuesday and every Friday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, on the Inception Radio Network. Jamie talks about everything. UFOs, paranormal, ghosts, conspiracy theories, you name it. Why don't you listen in? I do. Hope to see you there. You're listening to Inception Radio Network. Don't forget to check out InceptionRadioNetwork.com. Inception Radio for our last segment three of a three-parter that's been amazing and uh, it's going to continue to be amazing. We are here with our third guest of the night, Mr. Jim Tierney. Now, uh, I've interviewed Jim before uh, back when I was co-hosting on The Jackal's Head and uh, he does a lot of stuff. He's a stand-up comedian where he brings, uh, you know, UFOs and aliens into his uh, comedy. He also uh, does a lot of other things that you'll hear tonight, does some art, um, all types of things. So 
Welcome to the show, Jim. Sorry it took so long with this info, but we had to get that info out of the way. That was uh, some amazing stuff. I'm telling you what, I was just intrigued. What a great show, huh? I mean, it's going to be a hard one to follow. I was just on the edge of my seat there, huh? Yeah, yeah, that was that was great, and I'm so glad we were able to get him. And I can say, look, I was one of the first who interviewed him. Yeah, I'm telling you what. Now, you know what is like what was going through my mind through the whole thing is, I mean, if this was like the only story out there, it would be like dynamic, right? Yeah. But these stories just go on and on and on. And yeah. Put it on the end of the list, and here, here's just another one. And it was what 1977 or whatever, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a- just just look at the UFO and Nuke Conference they had uh, last year. You had all these retired um, officers, one enlisted men, come forward and say they seen UFOs disable their nuclear weapons. What happens? Nothing. I, yeah, and you know what? You know, you know, I'm immersed in this, and I get around, you know what I mean, with doing the stand-up and UFO stuff, so I'm interjected into the public circle of believers and non-believers, and... It's amazing that people are like, you know, I don't believe in UFOs. And I'm like, you know what? They don't believe in you either, okay? It's because they don't believe in you doesn't mean you don't <laughs> exist. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I just moved here to Pensacola, Florida from Texas, and like Gulf Breeze is like oh, a hot cool. spot. And I'm like, right here in the hot I don't believe in you. Know, it's like, come out of the closet, you know? <laughs> I can't. Ah. Here we go with just another amazing story, huh? Yeah, so you're in Florida now. That's That's cool. Yeah, I moved out of Texas, you know, I was in San Marcos there, uh, it's just south of Austin, producing my own stand-up room and laying down the tracks for the UFO show, but now here I'm in Pensacola, it's great, you know, I'm in a city again with sidewalks and traffic signals and buses and <laughs> all this stuff. Get out. You know, I gotta, say, I gotta say one thing that struck me about the, uh, the show tonight was a parallel, you know the measles story, how they got like ill and got sick? Yeah. Well, you know what? The, the, the 19, was it 1917, 1918, that Fatima sighting, you know, where the yeah, sun Fatima. shook in the sky and all that? Yeah, I did a show on that not yeah. too recently. Well, what happened was, at, after the sighting, there was this, and this happens more than once, where there's this kind of like a fiberglass angel hair type thing floats to the ground, and then when it hits the ground, it melts. Well, people were out just after that Fatima sighting, you know, and, of course, the sun shook. Of course, nobody else around the continent saw it because it was localized, so it was a definite some sort of, you know, apparition in the sky. But anyway, there was this silky, silky angel hair, like fiberglass stuff that fell onto the ground, and people were out there catching it, right? And then what happened was the Spanish flu broke out right there in Fatima and went around the world a couple of times. So it seems strange that there was this, you know, apparition in the sky and then this sort of dust fell into the ground and then the Spanish flu broke out, very similar to the measles story. Yeah, it is. I was surprised uh, when I talked to you this morning that that you actually knew about the John Vasquez story because... I've only been researching ufology for about three years now. How long have you been interested in this and researching it? Oh, I think I... You know, well, the thing was is I kind of got turned on to the, the question of it when I was a teenager, you know, when I was only like 15 or 16 years old, because, you know, even in 1975, 76, it was an old story, you know what I mean, from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. So by the time that I got clued on to in the mid-70s when I was a teenager, it was already an old story. But I really started to really do a lot of investigation on a scholarly level, probably in the late 80s to early 90s. So I've been following everything I can get my hands on at least for, you know, 20 years, you know. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, um, I've owned a lot of bookstores in my, you know, uh, in my career. And I've had, I've had a hobby of actually going to these old bookstores and finding all these old original hardcover copies from the 50s and the 40s, you know what I mean? All these yeah. all these 40 or 50 year old, you know, UFO books when it first broke, you know, so I have a collection of, you know, 30 year old, 40 year old hardcover original UFO stuff from the 50s, which is really interesting stuff, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's great to have you on because last time, you know, uh, you were just a comedian now. 
I see all your artwork, your bus. This stuff is amazing. I see. You, I finally found where Stan Romanek's uh, alien came from. <laughs> well, you know, I've been doing. <laughs> I've been doing that. I did that. I started up that art, the art thing, in 1990. You know, and I kind of shelved it for a few years, and then I picked it back up about 98. You know, so about 2000 is when I fired it up again. So I'm that's about a 14 or 15 year project. You know. Wow. So I've got, but what the real cool thing is I had like my artwork, you know, the ancient alien artwork, the stone artwork and the mystical symbols and the alien bus. I had that parked at one website and then I had my you know, sketch comedy parked at my director's website and then I had my YouTube stuff for the UFO stuff and my Facebook, but I've just got my new website up where I've got it all concentrated and, you know, it's all on one page. So I've got like my stand-up character, Vaudeville Vinny. He's the funniest <laughs> man in the world. And then I've got my sketch comedy, the, the full feature 45-minute UFO you know, stand-up act. And then all my artwork is all parked at jimtierneycomedy.com. And that's just like two weeks old. So it's okay. like been 17 years worth of work, and it's finally come together. So I'm really excited about that. i got I got to watch this with uh, Blind Billy on the Antiques Roadshow. That looks so funny. Uh, yeah. Well, what I did there with the sketch comedy is I was doing a, you know, uh, when I was living in L.A., we had a Time Warner cable show, and it was a sketch comedy show. Uh-huh. And episode two, we had a bunch of, a collaboration of a bunch of stand-up comedians, but episode two just happened to be all of my pen. So all of those sketches there, even if I don't even, you know, perform in them, they're all, you know, all written by me. But I wanted to maybe talk about the... Uh, let me see what's happening here. Oh, the UFO show. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me know about that. What's, what's well, it about? I mean, is it a talk show? Is a, what is it? Well, what I've done here is I put together a 45 minute feature, full, you know, full, full 45 minute feature stand up comedy act that deals just with, you know, paranormal and specifically UFOs and aliens. And now the, the problem the, the, is it's somewhat problematic. Because you see that, like tonight's show, you see how intensely serious it was? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Now, it's easy It's easy to be an outsider and poke fun and ridicule. Oh, yeah. Right? But, what I've, but what I've done is I've written an act for the informed from, like, from an insider's point of view. And um, I've designed it to be, you know, with enough act out, physicalization, characters, to be strong enough to work on a you know, in a mainstream, uninformed room, you know, because it's just, if it's funny enough, it'll be okay. Yeah. But the thing is, see, I'm, the problem is, you know, we could do jokes about Taco Bell and my dog and my mother-in-law and keep it like, you know, at an eighth grade level and hit the common denominator and everything is fine. But there's the, the problem, the, the, there's an ingrained problem here, and that is that the UFO story in the UFO, the whole community here, it's some, it's very serious. I mean, if you really approach it from an in the know perspective, I mean, anybody who has contact, or like the story tonight, I mean, it's somewhat tragic. There's people who are, their lives are changed, and it's not very, it, it's a serious topic yeah. from, from an insider's point of view, and it's very traumatic. So to make jokes or make light of a very serious, Topic. It would be like doing an act on missing children, or yeah, you know, yeah. white wife beating, or yeah. something like that. You know what I mean? It's a serious, traumatic. So to do jokes and make it funny, it, it's somewhat. It's it, it, it's it's a tough act. You know yeah, what I mean? it, it can work. I mean, um, it, it, it can work. You know, there, usually in my head, there's three levels of people within ufology there's people that take themselves way too seriously um that just go over the top with you know they're they are really serious and they they go by these strict guidelines and uh then there's people which i like to consider myself in which take things serious but also like to have fun and then you got your weirdos people that you know will say they're on another planet and talk to you and chat for a year and uh, oh, I see. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. But no, I, I I think it's good to have uh, stand up comedy with UFOs and aliens and all that kind of stuff put into it. It, it kind of 
you need that to to laugh at, and, and I'm sure. You well, know. that's true. You know, that's what I'm thinking. You know, because I think I might be a, a, ahead of the curve here on this. You know, because I've designed the show to work at the, you know, to work for like the, uh, you know, the UFO conventions, these big shows they put together. Yeah. Because they'll have astronauts and lecturers and authors and whistleblowers and intelligence people and journalists and movie stars and then they have like a meet and greet where all the celebrities you know they have like a banquet and dinner and dancing so I'm thinking you know what we could use a little stand up comedy in there but I'm getting a little bit of feedback because you know the people you know, some like you said they're so serious there's no room for humor yeah. you know there's not you know we're, this is for real this isn't <laughs> anything to joke about and I'm thinking, well, maybe I'm just ahead of the curve on this because if you take anything that's too, if you're too serious about something, then you're kind of missing the holistic view of it. But I do, I, but I, my show does not ridicule or put down, you know, the community. It's just like, you know, it's, it's from the inside, like I said, from the insider's point of view. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you go to my website at jimtierney.com, you can see I've got a bunch of videos that are posted there. You know, of, uh, you know, let me, let me pop over there. Yeah, and spell that for archive listeners while you're getting over there. It's uh, Jim, and it's T I E R N E Y, Jim Tierney Comedy.com. And then when you click over to UFO Stand Up, I've got one, two, I've got all 45 minutes here. You know, and, I'm, and as I scan down, you know, Aliens and Sex is a good one about aliens and, yeah. you know, uh, hybrids and if you had a wife that turned out to be a shape shifting alien and stuff <laughs> and you know my, me and my dad and UFOs is great it's like the John Lennon New York sighting you know when he and Yoko saw a full fledged flying saucer right outside their you know New York uh, apartment and then the Battle of LA you know which is a famous sighting and then yeah. the 1952 Washington DC flyby yep. you know and and Billy the Hick, Alien Fighter, is a great one. You know, and then I do I do a bit that's, uh, you know, uh, you know, I do a spoof where, you know, it's, this is what I was getting back to. It's like, it's so traumatic, you know, like cattle mutilations, implants, mind control, abductions, crop circle, you know, all that stuff. So what I did is I did this one act where this one farmer has his cattle all his cattle mutilated, his wife's been abducted, she's got implants, and, and, and but he turns it all around. So, you know, all the, all the bad, all the bad things, you know, turn into be, being a positive thing. So it's pretty funny, you know, and then there, so it's, it's a nice bit, you know, I like, I really like doing it, and I like performing it, and I've been working it, actually I've been working the act for about three years now, and it has, it has good response. And I get good response from it, even with, you know, in Texas and in Florida with, you know, some backwards people that aren't exactly up up on the whole, whole topic. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would guess that, that you would get a, a better response for, you know, just mainstream public people who, who uh, you know, they see it either on TV and the media, and the media always make light of it. They always have to put their little giggle in there. So... Yeah. You know, I'm pretty sure you, you know. You, I've I've watched the videos; they're great, and you get a good laugh too. Yeah. Well, the thing with you know the thing with it is, it's what you, what I've, on a professional level, what you have to do before you interject the topic and and the act itself is you kind of connect with the audience, you know. So I'll come out for a couple of minutes and tell a couple of corny jokes or something, and make friends with the audience and. Once they accept me, you know they have to buy. They have to accept you to <laughs> buy the premise if they're going to get the gag, you know, and then they'll go along with it. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Plus, the art side I've got, uh, the side also has um, um, a bunch of. Uh, let me see here. Let me pop back over there. Well, while you're doing bunch, that, um, I was going to ask you. I mean, have you ever bombed out on the, trying to do the UFO and uh, act? You know what? There's Everybody no bombs. such thing. No. Now, when you're a professional comedian, there's 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 no room to bomb. No, <laughs> I mean, no, 
no, there's there's no such thing as a bad show. I was watching uh, Donald Trump's, uh, what do they call them, Donald Trump's roast, and I forgot who got up there, but they bombed so bad. It was just, I felt so bad for him. Um, so, yeah, you know, your artistic side, I never knew that you were an artist, and this is some amazing stuff that you're working on. Oh, yeah, I really like this stuff. I've got, you know, the I've got, like, a, a an array of uh, ancient, uh, like, uh, ancient, you know, there's all this yeah, the hieroglyphs. Ancient, alien, yeah. ancient alien art from Egypt, Samaria, even the Native Americans, they have their glyphs with the sky people and yeah. stuff. Chikina, so I yeah. delved into that. And I've got a whole bunch of stuff like these alien busts where I do statues of greys and alien heads and I cast them out of like cement and gypsum stone and tone them and sand them and carve them out. And they're, they're pretty sharp, man. I really like doing them. They come I'm, up pretty nice. I might have to order yeah. one. If uh, I wonder if you could, could you do one life size or how big are these? Well, they're not, uh, the, they're like, you know, 12, 13 inches tall, okay. so they're almost life-size cut off at the head, you know? Okay. <laughs> well, I would, I'm not going to be able to do a a five-foot alien statue. Yeah, no, but, but uh, like, yeah, the head up is great. I mean, I could uh, uh, put that in a few people's windows and scare the hell out of them. <laughs> Let me copy this over. Yeah, and then I do, uh, you know, I, like uh, the, uh, the alien art, there's this Abydos... Are you familiar with that Abydos helicopter thing in Yeah, in Egypt? Egypt. Yeah, yep. Yeah, well, that thing is pretty cool, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good seller, and it's like a helicopter and a UFO and yep. a hovercraft right out of Star Wars and a submarine. I mean, it's just like flat out in your face. It's not like just one thing, you know what I mean? Like, oh, my God, that kind of looks like a helicopter. But there's a helicopter and like a speedboat and a UFO yep. and a hovercraft and it's like all in one, right? Yep. And the naysayers say that, you know, there was, you know, the one inscription and then they plastered over it and carved over another inscription and then when all the plaster fell out, you know, looked like both that, of yeah. them <laughs> happened to come together and look like this. Yeah, right. Yeah, right, I know. And it's not, yeah, but the thing is, the Abydos, the Temple of Seti, in Egypt was like the Vatican. Um, and, I mean, at, at a cheap temple, they might, like, rehab it and carve over it, but you're not going to paint over the Sistine Chapel. No. You know what I mean? No. They, they, they just didn't do that sort of thing in these revered, you know, sacred places. And on top of that, if you... The hieroglyphics that they say were transposed over on top of each other don't make sense anyway. Yeah. And no. this thing is just blatant in your face, so it's a strange thing. How do you, you know, do these? Do you have a, a master mold, or do you just look at it and draw it out? In in uh... well, what I do, what I do with these is I sketch out the original. Okay. And then I lay it down on you know I lay it down on thrower's clay, and then carve it out, and then like you said, I cast I put silicone rubber on the original and make a mold. Know, and then but it was all freehand to begin with and carve it out. And the thing is, you have to carve it negative to positive when you do a mold. Yeah. And and uh, that that they come out pretty nice, you know. They, they're really sharp looking things, you know. And they're priced good too. It, that Aptios helicopter is absolutely intriguing. Yeah. You know. And then you know, of course, that you got to do something with the Anunnaki. You know what I mean? With the Sumerian Anunnaki. Yeah. I mean, some of that stuff. Some of that stuff is just, I mean, blatant in your face. It's not really subject to interpretation because, you know, they wrote it down. I mean, their stories are like carved in cuneiform right in the clay tablets of the whole story of the Anunnaki and everything. So I do a Sumerian thing. And what I've done is I've picked out obvious things that are like, they're kind of blatant, like in your face. Like when you go down to the Anunnaki, Nazi star people, I mean, there's like, these guys are like star people coming down from the sky yep. with landing gear, and I mean, it's, you know, it's insane, and I don't know how these anthropologists and archaeologists can just look at it and go, oh, well, that kind of looks like a flying saucer, you know, yeah, yeah, it well, kind of looks like an alien, but it might be a, a turkey, you know, it might <laughs> yeah. be a turkey in the, oh, oh, yeah, right, yeah, sure, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, 
That's amazing. So yeah, the artwork I really like doing those stones. It's it's pretty it's pretty neat stuff. And I do some other stuff too, some mystical symbols, you know, the, like the yin and yang and the om and the ankh and a lot of goddess symbols from ancient, you know, pre-Christian Europe because they're just so pretty and the cosmology is intriguing. So those are pretty sharp too. I like doing those. Yeah. I got. I, I came into possession of some huge, huge crystals recently, and I've had them here. Um, it just, for some reason, came up on my mind. Uh, it'd be cool to do some stuff with them, kind of carve them out, because they're they're yeah. big. One's about seventy pounds. Just a huge. Well, they're hard to crystal. carve. Yeah. They're hard to carve. You know. I bet. There's like real dents. Yeah. That's why you see those crystal skulls. You know what I mean? Those yeah. things. Yeah. I mean that that crystal is hard carved because it's so hot. You know, it's like yeah. number nine on the scale. And those crystal skulls have no tooling, no polishing marks, no cutting, nothing. They're just like perfectly formed crystal skulls. Yep. They're insane. That's that's another enigma. There's enigmas everywhere you look. I'm oh, telling yeah. you, yep. truth is stranger than fiction, huh? Yeah, for sure. I had Cheryl Whitfield on, and uh, she's actually in possession of a crystal skull, and uh, that that was an amazing interview as well. Um, what are some other stuff you have on this site? Well, I've got, uh, there's another character that I'm doing. There's this character, you know, he's kind of a signature act. I, 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 had, I put him away for about five <laughs> years. Yeah. And everybody was, you know, everybody was like, Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy, this guy is great. You know, why don't you do him? And uh, he's a guy named called Vaudeville Vinny. And he's kind of like a cranker act. It's like an insult comic, and he does a bunch of real clever one-liners. And the thing in, with him, is Phyllis, Phyllis Diller has the world record for laughs per minute. She gets a laugh, like ten laughs a minute every six seconds. She's in the Guinness Book of World Records. And I've got Vaudeville Vinny at seven seconds a laugh. He's a 30-minute act, and he does seven seconds a laugh for 30 minutes. And he's just outrageously, outrageously funny, a high-energy character act. And uh, I broke him out. You know, I was doing the UFO show for like two years, and then one night I just got bored. You know, I'm like, I want to do something different. So I hadn't done Vaudeville Vinny in about three or four, four years or so, so I broke him out, and he just went over big, huge in Texas. So I just I developed him. I, you know, did the costume, did the wardrobe, and put him up to put him up to speed. And uh, he's hilarious. So I got about uh, my new DVD. It's the whole forty-five minute UFO show, and it has twenty minutes of Vaudeville Vinny, and then the half hour Tuesday Night Crew, which is my sketch comedy show, uh, the, the TV show that I did in California. But I'm. Vaudeville Vinny. You there? We have seen to uh, lost contact. Let me see if we can uh, get him back. Jimmy, there. Well, we'll see if, uh, I might as well open the phone lines in case Jim calls back in. Uh-oh, that's uh, not good. I don't know. Gotta talk to your producer and get him back on. Yeah, my producer's behind the glass partition, so we, we, we don't have a wired mic that goes from here, uh, behind the glass. So I can't, I just gotta do hand signals, like I always do. But, uh, we can try to, try to get Jim back on, uh, Again, um, let me let me try him back here. Let's see. I got so many numbers up here. <laughs> you heard me during the break. I accidentally called uh, <laughs> called Donnie, thinking it was Jim. Let's try him back here and see if we get him. <laughs> yeah, we lost you. Where did we leave off? Where where was I? Uh, you were just talking about uh, Vladville Vinny and, uh, you know, just how you brought him back, and uh, that's where we were. Oh, yeah, Vaudeville Vinny, yeah. 
he's pretty good. He's a character that all of my friends for the last like six or seven years just said he's the best thing that I've got going. But I shelved him for a while because I was working on the UFO show. But I was doing the UFO show and uh, for a couple of years, and I just kind of got bored one night and said, I'm going to break him out. You know, I was in a town uh, uh, right outside of Austin, and I decided to do Vaudeville Vinny, and they just loved him. So I brought him back and rewrote his act, and he does like a laugh every seven seconds, and Phyllis Diller has the world record at a, a laugh every six seconds ah, in his book. You're getting yeah. close. I think I think that's what happened is when they heard you were trying to compete with Phyllis Diller, the Never Say Anything organization just cut you off. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but possible. he's pretty strong. He's pretty strong, and he's really fun to do. He's what's, real fun to do. What's this uh, Legacy Stone? That's just some of your other artwork, the yin and yang. And, uh, yeah, some that's of your circular the yin stuff. and yang and the ankh and the om symbol, the divine mirror. Those are like kind of mystical symbols from all around the world, you know, like the om symbol and then yin and yang. Okay. It's just another chapter of the legacy stones outside of the alien artwork. And uh, I try to make what I try to do with it with the legacy stones is try to capture a little bit of a little bit of historical or religious or spiritual cosmology from all over the globe, okay. whether it's India, China, you know, Europe, you know, Africa, so when you get, or, you know, or the, you know, the, the United States, ancient America, so when you, what, and what I found is when you really trace back the spirituality and the cosmology, when you really go back farther, stories start to turn into the same story. I mean, through time, things split off, oh, yeah. and these cosmologies get split, and yeah. the stories get rewritten. But when you get way back in time, yep. you know, the original cosmologies really have to do with sky people. Yep. You know, it has to, uh, no matter where you go, in any continent, when you go back far enough, they came down from visitors, the sky. You know, yep. the visitors from the stars came and taught us how to count, how to write, and how to read, and how to grow plants, and... Doesn't matter if you're in South America, Arizona, China, Africa, you know the Middle East. So when you go farther, the farther back in time you go, these stories pull back together into the same story. So you find the very, you find very parallel cosmologies and creation myths, you know, all around the world. So I found that intriguing, and I said, you know what? Let's just take some of this stuff and. And put it out there, you know, reproduce it and, and you know, make it work. Yeah. I see you're doing some, some webcast. Are, are, do you have a schedule for that, or do you just do it every once in a while? Uh, just once in a while, you know, whenever it hits. You know, whatever we can do. You know, I'm really busy working stuff and working the shows, and, you know, the website's taking a lot of time and everything and putting everything together. And, you know, um, I do, I'm, I'm, I'm performing at least, you know, twice a week, you know, getting every, keeping everything sharp and crisp. So, uh, we just, we just keep going, you know, just keep, just keep hacking it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just keep, you know, that, and then here's the, here's, here's the real goal that I've really got going is that the DVDs for sale, the artworks for sale, and I'm working strong. But here's the real plan behind the scenes is um, I've designed, believe it or not, I've designed the world's most um, efficient wind turbine where it's this dual vertical blade, magnetically levitated, bit resisted, uh, tangential cross-flow fan where it's a free fur, it, it creates a vacuum and it's shrouded for resistance. So what I want to do is put together this wind turbine and then when you get 50% back on your tax credit and then a rebate nice. from the from the factory when you get your factory rebates and your tax credits if you pay 10 grand and you get 10 grand back you get it for free hmm. so what i'm trying to do is actually go into production with a wind okay. turbine and then get it out there for free if you if you ever if you ever need a patent, let me know. I got some connections. <laughs> I'm 
I'm working on it. Yeah, this thing is awesome. It's magnetically levitated with, and I've taken a cross flow fan design, and instead of having the cross flow, I've switched the blades to centurical blades where the wind blows through and it's shrouded so that so as it kicks around the opposite side, it doesn't have resistance, and it has this huge venturi that pulls it, pulls the vacuum through it. So it's actually a three fur, you know, it's not a two fur. So the the benchmark is you got to kick 12 volts out at four miles an hour of wind. And I've taught, I've, I've run the design of physicists and, and engineers, and they say it's a winning sign. So, I mean, uh, before this, I already had the materials, my prototype, my scale prototype. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, this thing is just amazing. So what I want to do is busting this thing out with this, you know, the aluminum and the, and the alternators. And like I said, it'd be... It's going to be ten thousand dollars, but you get a five thousand dollar factory rebate, and then you get a five thousand dollar tax credit. Yeah. So well, it costs you ten grand. I give you back five grand. The government gives you back five grand. So it'd be like, hey, Jamie, you want a wind turbine? Yeah. It's the most efficient wind turbine in the world. Yeah. You get free installation, and it costs you nothing. Okay. And who can say no to that? And if I distribute these things all across the country for zero. I mean, we're talking about decentralizing the whole power grid, and as these electric cars come into, you know, come up to speed, if you plug your electric car into the grid, it's still nuclear and coal. Yeah, it's still coal, yeah. You know? If you could get yeah, that so power yeah, from a wind turbine, it would be green. It's not green unless you're getting the true source from a green, you know, source. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, today in Florida, the wind was kicking at 10 miles an hour all day long, and I'm oh, outside yeah. going, my God, look at all of this mass and all this energy that's gone to waste. So my true goal here is to take all of my endeavors. My design is tight, you know, it's strong, and then production, with, you know, with this wind turbine and get it out there for free to everybody. You know, if I can make 100 bucks a hundred bucks a pop on it, who cares, and have my employees and my men and the, um, the labor force. You know. what's, what would the power output be, do you know? We got some people asking. Well, what it is, is, what it is, is they, you have your alternator that's a three-phase alternator that kicks out uh, alternating power, and then you convert it to DC, Yeah. and you can either put it into uh, in the back, and then they rectify it back to AC, and then to make it legal on the grid, you got to have a shutoff. In case the grid goes off and your wind turbine is still kicking out power, yeah. when the electricians go back to fix the line, mm-hmm. they'll get they'll get shocked. Yeah. So you got to have like a, a cutoff, you yeah. know, to make it legal. Mm-hmm. But uh, the thing will kick out, you know, the thing will kick out if you have two of them on your home. These things, it'll pay for half of your electricity, and when the electricity you're not using it and the wind's blowing, your meter spins backwards. Yeah, that, that's great, because then the, the power company's paying you. Well, Yeah, it comes off your bill. We're running uh, a little bit low on time. Just uh, give out your website again. i got to say it looks amazing. You put some hard work into it. Uh, give out your website, and uh, we'll wrap it up. All right, this is just my name, Jim Terry. Jim, Jim Terry, T-I-E-R-N-Y, Jim Terry. I'm the guy. And I've got the... Uh, I've got the... Uh, my DVD, you know, my DVD just came out of production. It's fully edited and ready to go. Okay. With with, uh, with, this, with the full 45-minute UFO stand-up show, half an hour of my sketch comedy, and the half, you know, 20 minutes of Audville Vinny. So that's parked there, plus all my artwork is parked there. So, uh, yeah, once again, it's Jim Tierney, jimtierneycomedy.com. All right. Well, thank you for coming on, and... Uh We'll be in touch, and uh, hopefully this wind, b- wind turbine thing, uh, we could do a show on that. So we'll keep in touch. I appreciate you coming on. And yeah, let, uh, me know. let me know about your pack. Yeah. Because i got the prints ready to go, and we're ready to move on that, man. That's the main goal here. That's, okay. the whole, that's the whole point where I'm heading with this whole show, is to take care of that project. All right. You well, had a great night. I, yeah. You know, thanks a lot. The show was just incredible. It's not and over yet. <laughs> Taken thirty, what is it? Thirty, thirty-three years, thirty yeah, years. Yeah, thirty-four. My God, but you're doing a great job. Thank Absolutely you. Absolutely fantastic job, man. Hats off to you. Yep, thank you. We're gonna we're gonna bring uh, 
uh, somebody on, uh, you know, just to wrap up what he thought about the show because he's been through similar things, and then we'll end our show. So uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. All right, Thank take you care. very much. Good night. Good night. All right, now let's bring on the man to get his thoughts on all of this. And uh, we'll call this man Codename Viper. Yeah, see? See, the people that left when Jim came on thinking there wasn't going to be nothing else, you know, in this thing, they left? Well, people that stay, you stayed for a reason. Viper. (laughs) What's going on? Uh, Just... I don't know. I was kind of blown away by the show. It just made me feel good that other people out there experienced the same thing I did. Yeah, well, that, that that's great. And, uh, you know, uh, James's story um, is just amazing. And to think, you know, his story was in the book in 2000, but at the time he was he was active duty. Now he's just reserve. So at the time he had to go by... You know, a name, a nickname. I think he was called uh, something N, Captain N, or something in the book. But uh, you know, a, a lot of the things, and the, you know, when 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 we first started, and and I was talking to him, and he would pop something in, and I'd ask him, and he says, "Yep, exactly." So, um, what's up with these Janet aircraft? I thought. You know the ones. Do they have ones that go to to the Las Vegas airport? They have tail numbers, don't they? No. None of the Janet Airlines have tail numbers. No. Wow. They fly from. Well, they fly out of Nellis up to Groom Lake, and they fly to like Edwards, um, Burbank, Wright Patterson. Um, and Andrews that I know of. Did you hear of Dugway getting closed down at one point? Yep. What, Several times. What what year was this? What years? Um, got shut down. 77, 79, 81, 82. But that was for, like, radiation and chemo. Yeah. They do some Leaks. crazy stuff oh. there. Yeah, they make some weird stuff there. Yeah, they got some, but that's all army. You know? It's uh, them people up there are crazy. Yeah, that's the thing I'm kind of interested about. You know, I I, uh, I was a marine. I did not serve as far as uh, in in active <laughs> duty, um, but I I did complete my training. And uh, I had my best friend, who we went in the Marines together, basically killed himself in front of me. So I, uh, I just couldn't continue. But uh, you know, I don't understand uh, how you know when it comes to these type of cleanups. Do the different military uh, agencies work together? Like you know, would the Army and the Air Force work separate, or in some cases, would you guys be on the same? Uh, crash site or same range? Yeah, it, like when we was out at Fort Bliss, the Army was there first. They, would, I mean, because they'd put a perimeter around it. And then whoever was, you know, like we used to have a major who made LC finally. Once he made LC, he was livable. But before that, he was unlivable. Um, whoever was highest in rank kind of controlled the site. So, but we always got to take the aircraft back to Papoose Lake or whatever you want to call it, alien craft, whatever craft we pick up. We always take it back to Papoose Lake. Okay. So, um, and sometimes the Air Force guys, you know, our, our CO would be there. He was a full bird colonel, an 06. Or Knight, um, Major Knight, he was, uh, an 04, and when he made 05, he was actually become because he'd been passed over so many times. Do uh, do the Janet craft have transponders in them? Um, yes, but they're never turned on. Okay. 
supposedly they are turned on because mo- most of the time Janet Air flies in restricted airspace. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's, like, people don't realize how big Nellis range, Nellis Air Force Base is. You know, I, it, it's bigger than most states when yeah. you take in the atomic bomb range, the test range, Nellis Air Force Base itself, Groom Lake, Papoose Lake. You know, it's bigger in most states. And then you make a little 40-mile jump from there, and you're, you're where Edwards is, Fort Irwin. You know, you, Fort Irwin's got like, a China Lake Naval Station. All those bases all interact together. So, I mean, because they're all getting their aircraft out of, like, Lockheed, uh, Boeing, Grumman, Northrop. So... They all enter work together real well, and it's like, hey, this is restricted airspace. Stay away from it. You yeah, know, that's what. Does Does yeah. Janet uh, move personnel around the United States like they do Las Vegas? If If say, say there was a company at McDill that that were going to Nellis, would Janet go and pick them up, or would they fly in on a C one thirty or something? No, no, Janet would go. There was when I was in. There was nine. Full. There, there was nine. Uh, There's seven thirty sevens. I think six yeah. of them were seven thirty seven one hundreds, and three of them were seven thirty seven two hundred models. You know, they had like a one hundred and a two hundred model. But at that time, we had, we had nine of them. All right. Well, you know, the, this story is just going to blow up because. Uh, it's it's only been on the internet, you know, uh, just just gaining notoriety in the past couple of weeks, and it's just going to keep blowing up. It would have been amazing to be the first interview, but basically we are going to be the first interview that people get to listen to unless you go and pay money to subscribe to uh, the Kevin Smith Show. But, um, you know, I hope that we can keep in touch with him as as he progresses because his main goal I gotta say he's got some balls his main goal is to try to get this stuff tested legitimately and to bring out all this uh, the video on his Facebook is is amazing it's some of the best uh, triangle footage I've ever seen in my life well see he's just like me he just wanted to get his story out there let people know that there there is stuff out there like me, I just wanted to correct Bill from using calling it Area 51 yeah, yeah. and call it call it Groom Lake Airfield. Call it what it is. Call it Papoose Lake. You know, a lot of people call it S4. Well, if they call it, you know, SL or SRL4, you know, then they'd have the correct terminology for it. You know, okay. um, we're like Los Alamos. That's SLR1, and um. You know, I I didn't come on for any notoriety. I didn't want no fame. Yeah. I I don't want want to make a buck off any of this. And he's doing the same thing. And to me, that gives him so much more credibility than like John Vasquez, who you know yeah. wrote a book what 15 years ago or something. He's been yeah. trying to get it out there and stuff. But, yeah. I mean, because we heard about this guy way back when, back in. Either it was the late seventies, early eighties, when I was at Papoose Lake, because we was laughing about it, because he was trying to get, um, um, he was trying to get a medical discharge for PTSD, you know, because he couldn't sleep and he was all freaked out, and he had all these psych evaluations and everything, and um, that's why I wanted you guys to find out, you know, how, you know. What was his discharge? How did he get discharged out of the army and stuff? You know, because I mean, my paper says honorably discharged, and I'm just wondering what his was. Yeah, well, I mean, he has to. Uh, yeah, Dave, if you just muted your mic, that was you for sure. I heard that whistling coming. Um, uh, what if he had a dishonorable? Would he still be able to be in the reserves? Uh, no. no. Okay, so he had an honorable discharge. Yeah, you you could stay in with a, a general, but I think it'd be a general with exceptions. I don't know. 
John about that. That's probably I should have asked him um, how he got I, out. I, I, I totally remember his story. I, I, I remember us making fun of it um, because, hey, there's this army guy way out in Georgia someplace. You know, he's trying to get discharge or something because uh, you know, of the alien aircraft and we were laughing about <laughs> it and it's like you know, uh, what what would the guy do if he was here and, and seen what we got here? You know, he, wow. he'd, he'd never sleep again. You know, and it's like. Uh, well, when I when I talked to him in private, I believe he said that uh, he had been warned that his pension would be pulled if he continued something. So um, he had to have an honorable discharge to continue getting a pension. Correct. Right. Now you're talking about Vasquez. Vasquez? Yeah. Well, uh, That's who you're talking he, about, right? Oh, yeah, he must have got his PTSD there. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I see, because I got... Um, so he's getting his... He won his VA hearing, and he's got his uh, VA paper saying that, you know, the Army did screw him up. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of scary. What I found interesting is the the correlation between this 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 measles type thing between him, um, them two, and and you even uh, kind of have an idea about what this stuff is too. You know. Um, let's see. Yeah, you're still there. Um, yeah. But uh, John said that that when he got his, he said like a like a fuse was blown, and like when they zapped him, and and it was like red spots broke out in that area. So I find that interesting. That that um, and, and other people have said that as well. I talked to a friend of mine uh, who was in the Air Force, and and he still suffers from it down his legs. Both of his legs are. It, it looks really bad. It looks like. Uh, psoriasis just broken out everywhere, but uh, he says he contracted it while he was in the Air Force. Yeah, I, uh, I would say when it starts to dry up, you get that psoriasis type look, and then my legs would just clear up, and then when they break out, it's like my legs got the measles. I got a, a million of these tiny little red spots, and the next day they'll be like a, a clear white and it's just uh, all water liquid in them and when the, my girlfriend rubs the sab up and down my legs those little like I don't know puzzles or whatever they'll break and it's like water just runs down my leg or uh, underneath the sab and she has to rub it in real well yeah well that's crazy well I just wanted to get you your thoughts on tonight's show I'm gonna uh, this is probably uh, this is definitely the most consecutive guest I've ever had on one show. Not that I've I've done an eight hour show before. That was insane. Never again. I don't see how certain people like Tom Donahue, this guy does three hours, five days a week. Um, we did three hours tonight, and it just seemed like forever. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing your opinion with uh, with us about you know just just correlating some evidence that. Uh, that both of them talked about, and hopefully we'll we'll see what ha- unfolds in the future. And uh, this will be interesting. I'm sure we'll get a lot of comments in the archives. So, thank you for three, uh, three hours. Felt like 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Jamie. I appreciate it. It was a great show. I I, I really enjoyed listening to it. All right. Well, everybody out there, we're going to wrap this up and. Uh, We'll see you back here tomorrow at noon for West Georgia Paranormal and at 6 p.m. Eastern for Future Theater. You don't want to miss it. Take care. Thanks for tuning in.
Thank you guys for tuning in to Inception Radio tonight. Remember, we're live Tuesdays and Fridays at 9 p.m. You can listen to our show if you missed it at floridaufo.planetparanormal.com. Take care. I'll see you next time.